Hello, Tribe. This podcast is sponsored by Four Sigmatic. Four Sigmatic is a natural superfood company that specializes in mushroom-based drinks that benefit our immunity, energy, longevity, and keeping us healthy and enhanced in our lives. Four Sigmatic makes a wide variety of blends, including mushroom coffee, mushroom elixir, hot cacao, matcha, and superfood blends. I believe strongly in this company. I've been taking Four Sigmatic and it has changed my life. I can't even begin to start my day without a cup of Four Sigmatic in front of me. Right before I meditate or I do anything from speaking engagements to traveling to doing healing on people or just going out in the world and sharing my immense love for this planet and for everyone on it. I feel lit times one thousand. It is literally shifting the energy in my being. I'm talking firing off those synapses, kicking my body into high gear by awakening those electrons, spinning those electrons, getting my body so on point with my focus, my creativity, and my energy. One of the products that I love the most is the Lion's Mane's Coffee. Lion's Mane promotes productivity and focus, and it was known by shamans and monks who take that into their body for meditation, focus, and clarity so they can really tune in to the energies and absorb the knowledge and information that is coming to them from the spirit world. And as you know, on Ancient Wisdom Today, we like to keep it lit all day every day. And how do we do that? By creating magic. And what is magic? Magic is turning up that energy, living our truth, honoring who we are, and doing what's right for us so that we can live a beautiful, powerful, easy, playful, fun, joyous, and just the most powerful life in this now time. So if you don't have Four Sigmatic on your shelf, in your bag, in your briefcase, on the airplane with you, right before you speak, whatever it is that you do, you have to get this. Even for your kids, for your teenagers, pop it in their in their bag before they go to school. This is the drink that literally makes you think. It is powerful and it is enriched with so many powerful mushrooms. And these adaptogens are literally changing the lives of people. And remember, I've talked to you many times before in the past about mushrooms and the networking system of mushrooms when it gets into your body and just really taking your body to a whole new level. So if you're interested in learning more about this amazing company, because I just really want you to know, Tribe, that everything I share with you, I share with you from my heart because I believe in it and I see what it has done for me and my life and all of my friends and family. Go to foursigmatic.com backslash shaman Durek, and you will get a discount code at your checkout. That's F-O-U-R-S-I-G-M-A-T-I-C dot com backslash shaman Durek for your 15% off. I love you tribe. I love you so much. That is the reason why I choose sponsors that are in alignment and authenticity to what this tribe is about. Staying lit, staying focused, staying driven, and changing our planet for the good. Love you. Enjoy the share. Bye. Human beings have been sharing stories for hundreds of thousands of years. And with those stories came the emotional, spiritual, and physical knowledge of the ancients. Shaman Durek is a third-generation shaman, an evolutionary innovator, and a women's empowerment leader. He's here to bring forth the ancient wisdom of our elders to help heal and bring happiness into our modern society. We're sharing ancient knowledge in modern times in order to put the power back in people's hands. Welcome to the tribe. 
Hello, tribe, and welcome to Ancient Wisdom Today podcast. And I love you. I am so happy that you're on this planet and that you are lifting and shifting yourself into all of these amazing higher possibilities for change, for growth, and for innovation and for creation, because that's what you are. You are a powerful quantum creator. You've come into this embodiment to shine your light through your vessel as you are. And no one can be you, only you can do it better because that is who you are and there is no replication. There's only you. And that's what makes it so wonderful and powerful to just be you and express you as you are and bring that beautiful, wonderful, powerful, enlightened, creative, sensual, playful energy into this world. And I'm so happy. So if anyone hasn't told you today that they love you, let me be the first. I love you, love you, love you, love you, love you, love you, love you so, 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 so much. And you are such a gift to this planet. And I am so happy to be here to share with you, tribe, all of the amazing knowledge and wisdom that has been passed down to me from my ancestors and also for those who are coming into the tribe to share their knowledge and wisdom with the tribe and to just take us even higher and keep us on that lit train, drinking that lit juice and living our life in the highest way. And I also, and get ready for this, I have an amazing, powerful brother in the studio with me today. He is a spirit initiator. He has come here to initiate you into new ways to think, to expand your consciousness, to remove doorways that are no longer serving you so you can see deeper into the truth of who you are. And he connects to the spirits, to the energies, to the waves of communication that move through you and through everything around you to give you vision and insight into a greater understanding of what it means to be here on earth and in be in this embodiment. As a spiritual initiator, you have to understand that he is stepping through the veil where most people don't feel comfortable and he is bringing forth knowledge and wisdom to the tribe and sharing his love with everyone. So I'm so happy to have this insightful, powerful, amazing, loving, kind soul in our studio today. Welcome to The Share, Phil Good. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here today and to connect with you. <laughs> Thank you. I'm happy that you're here. Me too. <laughs> so, so tell the tribe, you know, um, a little bit about yourself. Yeah. How, how, did you, how did you come into being this powerful spiritual initiator for humankind? So um, when I... At 22 years old, I, uh, I had a psychic, uh, a psychic breakdown. So I had a mental breakdown and I had to be hosp hospitalized for it. And I was diagnosed bipolar and I had tapped into so much magic at the time, even though I was not balanced in my being, but, uh, it was a pretty arduous road. It was pretty, pretty rigorous. And I was in the hospital wards for, I would say about three years on and off. And the, what activated that was marijuana. I had never tried smoking marijuana and I tried it for the first time and my kundalini just blew open. So then when I was put on meds, I had to, um, the kundalini went back to sleep and I took five years to kind of build my constitution from the inside out again and to fortify my spirit. And then eventually I, um, I went in to try to meditate. I was 26. I tried to meditate. And within five minutes, I felt the Kundalini serpent rise up from the base of my spine. And it was an instantaneous, almost like a walk-in experience where I could feel this higher consciousness coming online. And this was completely life-changing. And overnight, I, I, this new awareness, this new intelligence came online and I was able to, I started to clean up the mess that I had made at, at an unconscious level, but I changed my ways ra rather rapidly. And the Kudalini has been with me since 2011 and I work with it every day and I can connect with the astral realm. I work with a lot of energies like the Merlin, <laughs> the Merlin energy, with it, which is the the inner sorcerer, um, and Merlin is way more than just one person, one archetype. Merlin is a network. I call it the mind of Merlin. Many of us doing this wizardry work, and so forth. And I work with uh, my other guys as well. And I have one called Lefty who speaks to me in my left ear, and Merlin, and then the Syrians, the Sirius Collective. And my main job is to I consider myself to be kind of like a bone collector, <laughs> except that I'm like a a data collector. 
collector of sorts, right? So I go into the astral realm and I pull in information and I share it with the world and in such a way that it's digestible by the audience. So I was thinking about this on the way here. Like if you're walking with a pit bull, a physical pit bull on the street, you're not afraid of the pit bull. That's your, your pit bull. You love your pit bull. But as you walk by other people, they might feel afraid. And that's because you're picking up on that collective energy within that feed, within the pit bull feed, right? All these, the, these energies that have been associated to pit bulls around fear. We don't actually need a physical pit bull to draw this information. You can just utilize your imagination to unlock these different codes, to unlock these different information. So that's what I do throughout the day is I shift myself into different dimensions of thought and uh, I receive different communications. Well, yeah, I definitely have that whole thing with a pit bull because I grew up in Hawaii and I had a <laughs> uncle who used to uh, have these pit bulls called Makalea and Kilamea and they were vicious. They would like terrorize, like they would basically would try to bite everyone. So I have definitely a fear of pit bulls, but I'm working through, um, you know, those types of fears. I, you know, I was listening to what you were saying and do you think that this, that because there was a synthetic nature to the medicine that was being given to you, that's what lowered your Kundalini and, and when you took uh, marijuana, which is THC, which is much more of an expanded energy, mm -hmm. do you feel like that's what um, kept it going up? I would say so, definitely. I feel like the marijuana activated the full potentiality of what my mind was capable of stretching into the other dimensional timelines and so forth. And, uh, and so in many ways, it was like a bittersweet because on one hand, it, it sent me into the hospital. But on the other hand, if it wasn't for that, I mean, it was my catalyst. So in that respect, I would say that even though I don't smoke anymore, uh, I would not do that just because it's what catalyzed this, this um, I guess you could say this premature Kundalini awakening. But I'm very grateful for the experience. Um, and and now, I mean, if it wasn't for it, I mean, it shaped me in many ways. Right. So, you know, it's interesting because in shamanism, we have this. Um, it's it, you know, and exists in all shamanism, all different cultures of shamanism. Uh, that if a person has bloodline in the shamanic roots, and they have powers inside of them, and they're in a family or a situation where they don't utilize those powers, the powers turn against you and start making you sick. Mm -hmm. And usually, what happens. Uh, you can always tell first people will start having panic attacks. Mm -hmm. um, they'll get like cramping in their stomach that comes out of nowhere. Um, they'll notice that they, they feel like recluse from everyone around them. They want to get away from other people's energies. Mm -hmm. they, they go into what we call a complete um, emotional meltdown mm -hmm. internally. Mm -hmm. That can come out in many different ways. It can come out through an illness. It can come out through, you know, some kind of ulcer or something that gets created until they accept their powers. And so it keeps going around and around until finally, until at some point, it takes them off the planet. And it's really interesting. And so it would be interesting because what you just described when you were describing it to me, I was listening and I was thinking, oh, yeah, yeah. You know, this exists in shamanic culture. And the, the energy of, you know, when you're talking about the Kundalini, we look at the Kundalini differently in shamanism. We look at it from the understanding of Lilith, mm -hmm. which is the first snake that spoke to Eve that told her about how to raise her consciousness and be as a god. And so it's interesting how different cultures, um, of course, and, you know, in Hinduism and so forth, will utilize the same energies from the ancient days. Mm -hmm. And if you look on the hospitals, you'll see the two snakes, which represents the Kandias, which is with the snakes representing that Kundalini flow, and then the angel wings, which mm -hmm. represent the enlightenment of health, embodiment, and spiritual development. Mm -hmm. But hospitals don't definitely... They definitely <laughs> won't give you that intel. <laughs> yeah, and you see it on the, on the pharaohs. Um, definitely. I mean, I work with a lot of serpent energy as a whole. I work with an entire Cobra collective. <laughs> and, and they work with me on, on staring at them in the face without fear, with, with respect, but still holding my own. And they're really good at traveling through the tunnels or the corridors of the DNA structures and gathering information as well. So I like to work with different energies like the Cobras and all kinds of dragons. I mean, dragons are very symbolic of the Kundalini energy as well. So I like to work with a myriad of different spirits. I love that. Yeah. Snake. I have one of my spirit um, animals is a snake. And there's a, there's a realm in the spirit world where 
it's up in the clouds and you, there is a whole c- uh, community of spirits that are called the Tektais and they're half human, half snake. Mm-hmm. And they're very powerful and they're very, they were old guardians of the old times, of the times of the Anunnaki's and so forth. And they have bring a lot of wisdom when, we're, when we feel that we're humble enough to receive it. A lot mm-hmm. of times they don't just let anyone go into their realm. So I, I love that what you're saying. So when you're, so tell me more. So what do you feel about like what's happening? And I'll kind of give you my point of view because I feel like a lot of people right now on planet earth are looking towards um, plant medicine, looking towards synthetics, looking towards all of these things. And I don't see it as this bad thing. I see it more as a, because it, they're feeling that something's missing from them. Mm-hmm. And I feel like they're, they're wanting to reclaim this power inside of them that makes them this superhuman, but it's been taken from them, from the system, from the school system, from, you know, being put into an institution. What are your thoughts on that? I would say definitely. I, I like what you said around not necessarily condemning it because we've definitely moved out of duality consciousness now. It's really just about removing the blanket of judgment off of everything that we do. So say that you want to explore with an ayahuasca, that's great. The problem lies in when it becomes a crutch. And then, and that goes for everything. If you read a good book, it's very likely that you're going to imbue that book with your own power. The idea is to either hold your own as you're reading the book and remain in your center or fully indulge in the experience. And then when you're done reading, take your power back. So I think it's just a matter of your approach. If you're approaching it sensibly, like you're not depending on something outside of you to unlock an internal doorway then you're going about it the right way. You're just seeing it as an experience. You're going to go in and you're going to observe what comes up for you and um, and take in the information. It may unlock a door. But from my own personal understanding and what I've experienced personally is the pineal gland is responsible to be the stargate to those other dimensions. So if we take the time to meditate avidly to stimulate it, to activate it, then you can send yourself into the astral realm, into those fifth dimensional, sixth dimensional, seventh dimensional landscapes. And those landscapes are extremely um, necessary in bringing things down into the physical reality because you create at a template level, I call it the the blueprint level. Mm -hmm. And then everything that you create up there is going to have to file down as your physical reality. It's almost like dialing a phone, right? You're going up there, you're dialing, you're setting in these different coordinates, and then your physical reality has to become a vibrational match to what you've created internally. And that's working with the higher mind. So if you're constantly depending on these things to elevate your mind, there's no judgment, but eventually the the ideal would be to utilize this experience to connect to what it does for you, to open up this portal, if you will, and then find a way to access this portal when you're not utilizing it. Beautifully said. Yeah. I call it, I call it when I see people going into that space, I call it worshiping the golden calf. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. they're still looking for the power outside of them. Yep. You know, that's why I look at like even with celebrities, you know, people are like, oh my God, look at them. Da-da-da. I'm like, no, look at yourself. Go. Exactly. Right. Go. Is, I call them hungry ghosts. It's mm. like you can't get enough. You're constantly munching on more cookies and more cookies, more cookies. (laughs) And eventually you need to trust yourself. You need to trust the wisdom that comes from within because the wisdom has no form. The wisdom has no words. It's a matter of taking the informational energy and translating it in a way that's palpable, in a way that's digestible, in a way that's relatable for people and also actionable. But definitely there is... We can get caught up in, in the illusion of what's out there. And all of these plants, they're fine. There's no judgment there. Go explore with it, but don't become too reliant on it because then you're going to set yourself up to be spiritually handicapped. Right. You know, we have this, uh, and, and when we're kids we're in, and when we're training as kids in shamanism, we have this thing mm-hmm. called dimensional reality. So if we put our attention and our attachment and our reaction on what's happening now, we're actually saying that this is the dimension I'm grounding myself into, Mm -hmm. where we have this thing, we call it going liquid or, you know, um, being um, free in spirit. And going liquid and being free in spirit basically means that we don't put our attention, we don't put our reality of hold, which means to uh, 
react or to believe that this is what's really happening. And we decide by doing this complete scan of all the different dimensions, our possibilities that are different from the one that we're actually seeing. And then we pull that in and step into that. Mm -hmm. What do you feel why people want to hold on so much? And I see, and I, and I, and I'm, by the way, I just want you to know how much I love you and I'm so happy we're together, (laughs) you know, because now we feel the same way, you know, yeah, I feel the same way. (laughs) Now we can be like two kids in, in you know, in the candy store. The, the reality of consciousness that is held within this frame that people are holding on to, which is like, woe is me, I'm a victim, I'm suffering, this and that and the other, instead of choosing to pull out of that dimension and then go through all the possibilities of dimensions and then lock themselves into the one that actually suits them for their most like loving, most nurturing, most giving, most profound place. Mm-hmm. So... Um, so what was the question exactly? Sorry. Why do you feel people are holding on to that? I think because whenever you're programmed, I call them microchips or etheric implants, your third eye is blinded. So they don't know better. They don't know better. They think, oh, the ayahuasca is going to be my Superman. It's going to rescue me. It's going to open me up to all these different dimensional realities. And I like what you said about going liquid. It's very much like shape-shifting. You know, and and we really do have so much availability at our fingers now uh, as far as different um, energies that are upon us. Like the example with the pit bull, when you're, if you're walking down the street with a pit bull, you're tune, tuning into the dimension of the fear that is held around pit bulls. So it's not so much that that very person that you walk by has the fear. They may have a trace of fear, but it's more than that. You can actually peer into that entire collective of the fear that's held around the pit bull. So I encourage people to work with their imagination because you can shapeshift yourself without having the pit bull. You can imagine yourself to be a dragon spitting pink fire, spitting blue fire, those whole different qualities of energies. They're different flavors. And then by working with your imagination, you're going to be able to access those different realms of thought. But I think right now people are looking for the shortcut. They're looking for that instant gratification because they've been programmed to seek validation. They've been programmed to want more. They've been programmed to accept less. So they're still treating, in a way, they're still enslaved to these other dimensional forces because they're depending on these forces to feed them wisdom, to feed them this, that's okay if you're working with your guides, if you're working with higher dimensional energies that have no attachment to this world. They're just doing it because they want to do it. They don't have, I even got this interesting thought that they're not even really speaking to us. They're just holding frequency. <laughs> right. And we're, they're broadcasting that frequency, which is now available to us. But the, the, the main thing for people to, to realize is to not get too caught up in the illusion. Everything that's out there is really just a hologram. Mm-hmm. It really is. From one viewpoint, it's real because having kids is a real thing. Loving your partner is a real thing. That's part of the experience. From a different viewpoint, all of these things in your life just represent an aspect of who you are. That's all it is. And if people start to see themselves as whole again, then they won't out, outstretch their hand to look for something else to save them, to rescue them. Nothing is going to save us. The only thing that's going to save us is the higher octave of who we are. So it's a matter of working with those energies, working with the emotions. The other thing I want to share is that people are too focused on the physical realm as far as like they work with the physical things. Like you and I are sitting on a beautiful couch right now, but the fact of the matter is we can't change the color of it. And I think people are too fixated on working with the energies that have already been manufactured rather than working with their internal template at an energetic level and then having their universe bring that bring to them the physical form. So I'm all about working with my emotions, working with my energy, yeah. working on these higher dimensional landscapes. Yes. And everything that I activate up there is going to activate within me because it's my DNA that is responsive. So if I activate the realm of the cobras, that's going to activate my my DNA of the cobra. And then because my physical reality has to conform to my belief systems, it has to adhere to my thoughts, it will have no choice but to wrap itself around that DNA that I've activated. So if people start to work with their emotions, that which is unseeable, right? Then they will get to a point where they understand that the physical reality is really just a a servant to what you've created within. That's Mm -hmm. all it is. It's a servant. It's the reflection. 
Yes. And people get too caught up and too rolled up in, in what's out there. And it's, that's not the key. <laughs> yeah. We call it in, uh, we call it in shamanism, um, being a great dreamer. So mm -hmm. if the, if you can dream a great dream from within the dream, you get to experience that dream from without. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's interesting because the consciousness of reality is, is constantly shifting based upon one's perception. And every person has a different perception. Mm -hmm. So they're holding on to this kind of, this dialogue you know and the dial is always present where they can always shift into another perception it's like shifting 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 but what happens is people get so caught up in being nosy in certain energetic frequencies mm -hmm. that they don't shift because they're so entertained right. and i think that's why the entertainment industry is so so pronounced on our planet mm -hmm. you know because mm -hmm. you go to other planets you don't have uh you know that level of, of entertainment being the, the key factor for one's attention. Sure. You know, the attention is much more on how can we continue our civilization and raise our technology so we can help other planets and other galaxies. Mm -hmm. Whereas ours is more about you know, how can we get more distracted? How we can get more into other people's business? How can we get more focused into something? Because we're not shifting ourselves into realizing that we have this amazing power to dial in, change the, the frequency waves, change the, the energy um, patterns, and then re-graph a whole entire uh, holographic experience mm -hmm. through being inward, mm -hmm. you know, and that all the controls are inside, you know? Yes. And it's it, funny because I did, I did like a video <laughs> and the title of it was, I was really just you know, poking a little bit because I knew that it would trigger a reaction in people was <laughs> Kim Kardashian is your spiritual teacher, you know, because it, in a way, like a lot of people throw hate and they throw shade on, on people out there on, on social media and so on. And if they were to look within at the triggers and rather than pointing a finger and being down someone's throat, just look within, that's how we're going to construct this new earth reality. Because just like I was talking about before, like you can conjure things on the higher dimensional landscapes. They've already been achieved, but then they actually have to be integrated within the physicality, within the physical earth grid, right? Yes. But everything starts as energy, including disease. So once you, the same goes with new earth. New earth has already been conjured, but then we have to bring it down and integrate it within the physical grid. The only way that we can do this is if we hold ourselves accountable for how we respond to what we attract. So if you're attracting a, a post from Kim Kardashian, that's yours. You're responsible for that. How are you going to respond to that? And dependent on how you respond to it, you're going to that's going to be the deciding factor as it relates to whether you're not whether or not you're constructing the new earth or whether or not you're still playing and participating in the old duality reality and it's all about shifting ourselves out of this duality now that's how we're going to do this because it's already been built and now we have to all we've all been stationed different places like you're doing your thing i'm doing my thing we're collaborating today all these different star seeds way showers leaders are doing their thing and together as one we can come together and build new earth but we all have to be stationed different pl places and then come together sometimes and unite our forces but that's the idea is to recognize that everything the altruistic reality the the fifth dimensional abundant realities where there is no lack where there is no judgment where there is no separation already exists, but then our job is to be the ground crew. Our job is to file that information down and actually cement it into the physical grid. I love that. Well, you know, I don't know if you know a lot about my story, but when I was 28 years old, I took my rites of passage where I physically died. Um, I went into anaphylactic shock, suffocated to death, liver shut down, organ shut down, and then basically flatlined and died. When I went to the other side, I got to see with my elders, I got to meet with other tribal members, I got to meet with friends and all this kind of stuff. And when I was there, which was so beautiful, it was like amazing. I can't even begin to tell people they think they know what an ocean looks like. It's so much better there and the food tastes so much better there. And But the cool thing was they giving me an option to either stay or come back. And one of the things that I learned when I was on the other side was like what you said, all of those realities exist. And so I thought that was really interesting. The other thing that I learned is that we came here, we don't need a human body. We came here to an evacuation mission uh, that our brothers and sisters use their power to create a dualistic field. And that dualistic field created a separation mm -hmm. that we call the underworld. So every being that can't let go of their attachments or judgments or their hate or their this or their that, 
the light comes for them, but then they choose not to go into the light and they go into this underworld. Mm -hmm. And most human beings on earth and shamanism, the way we're taught as kids, is that anytime we hear a negative thought in our head, anytime we get a negative thought going through our mind or our feelings at any time, it's a spirit from the underworld asking, it's telling our, its story of its life through us. And we're supposed to answer that call with love and then respond with love and then bring them and then create the light for them so they can go home. Mm -hmm. And what happens is that uh, the reason why shamans and all from African culture to Peruvian culture to Native American to Balinesian culture say that humans are stuck because humans keep thinking those thoughts are theirs. They do. And, and from one viewpoint, you can say that they are because we've adopted them as our own, and we've believed them for such a long time. And from the higher viewpoint, you would say that none of them are ours, and we came here to sweep away all those energies. It's the spiritual Swiffer. <laughs> like, swift away, swift away, swift away. And, and, and it's amazing when you start to utilize your third eye to look into this... Um, collective Facebook newsfeed of all the streaming thoughts. It's like a live stream. Every thought that is actively being entertained goes, it get, gets live streamed into this active newsfeed. <laughs> and with your third eye, just through your awareness, or just by bringing awareness to these thoughts, you neutralize them. And that's what we came here to do is to awaken so that we may reascend and help our brothers and sisters ascend with us. But most people are still caught up in, in thinking that their thoughts are theirs because their consciousness has been hijacked. It's been hijacked, but you can't be hijacked unless you unconsciously agree to it. Yeah, we believe that. Or shamanism. subconsciously agree to it. So the idea is to recall your power. The idea is to start claiming that you're whole again. Make that divine declaration, I am whole. And every time you have an intrusive or an insidious thought that tries to dictate otherwise, no, don't accept it. Return to sender. Return to sender. And that way, you can start to quarantine these energies. Because the starseed mission, I consider myself to be a starseed, and I, I assist a lot of starseeds. The starseeds have come from an advanced civilization, from these higher timelines. And they've hacked this artificial system to then open up portals that will bring in light so that we can free ourselves, so that we can help other people free themselves. What is a starseed? A starseed, to me, the best way that I would describe a starseed is someone who is who has come, it, they've been blueprinted with these higher dimensional codes. So they've come from the future, if you will. So they think in a very progressive way. They, they're able to see that judgment isn't real, they're, that it keeps you anchored in a lower dimensional timeline, that it keeps you anchored in those lower grid fields of existence. And they've come back, they've traveled through this tunnel, right, through time and space. And the best example I can give you for that is, say that you've went through something that was pretty traumatic at 15, or you went through a really rough or tough breakup. How you told that story back then would be completely different than how you would tell the story now. Because you now see your part in it, you've rewritten the script, if you will, right? So the star seed has traveled back into a memory engram, except that it's a hologram. It's, it's no different than going back into a memory you had at 15 and giving gratitude for the experience and seeing what part you played in it. And now you're, you're sharing the story in a different way because it's, you've, shift, you've shifted the energy of that entire thing. And what you thought was real isn't real anymore because you've assigned new understanding to it, a new meaning to it, right? So the star seeds are doing the exact same thing. They've returned back into the past, which is this present, to seed the, the present with future energies. Because how I view it is there are always different potential, potentialities brewing, as you know. So say that Mother Earth was on a trajectory towards um, demise, where people were overly infiltrated. And their minds were so hijacked that it wasn't, it, it didn't prove to be hopeful anymore. Well, the star seeds heard the call, you need to go assist planet Earth in helping these humans remember who they are. So they hold that frequency and then it gets threaded out to the entire collective. And another, I just, just, just off the top of my head, another example I can give you, we work at, we consider ourselves to be grid workers. So when I meditate, I may be appearing to be alone, but I'm not alone. I'm working with all the spirits. I'm working with all the grid systems. And so if you were to go meet someone on a date, for instance, and you were really in your spirit and you're holding that frequency, right? 
They might feel your energy and they're going to say, I have to go work out today and get ready for this date and blah, blah, blah. And I'm going to get super nervous. And they're having to like acclimate to your frequency. Think of this as a collect on a collective level for the star seeds. We are holding a frequency which is making everyone flail, <laughs> mm. which is making everyone have to go to the gym and get nervous and deal with their stuff. That's what we do. Interesting. We well, work at a, at a template level and we're working with the higher timelines and the higher timelines, if you were to take it to a linear scale, is really just the future. So we've already seen the future, that we've already come together as one that life is abundant, that there is no more judgment, there is no, no more separation. So we're constantly holding that higher vibrational resonance for the collective. So, because I'm, you know, I'm going with my shamanic mind, right? Yeah. So, but I'm learning a lot from you, so this is great. So in shamanism, we, believe, we don't believe in future. We believe that there is no future yes. um, and that there are many possibilities of mm -hmm. future, but we believe that we're creating it as we open our mouths, as we hug someone or not hug someone as we yes. eat something or not eat something. So we see ourselves as these quantum creators who are creating both through intellect, through emotions, through physical and through spiritual connection to mm -hmm. whatever, you know, let's say for instance, like uh, someone is in a pattern of fear. We see it in shamanism as they're, collect they're connected to every other person who's in the pattern of fear. Yeah. And then we ask ourselves, do we want to go into that tribe? Or do we not want to go into that tribe? And do we just want to send love to that tribe and focus on the energy where we can build from? So we look at everything as a building or taking apart. Mm -hmm. So I always ask people, are you creating or destroying? So going with that, which is very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? Do you think I'm a star seed? What do you I, think I, I would, am? You're definitely a star seed. Really? 100%. So, you're an active star seed. And I consider myself to be an active star seed. There are star seeds who, who may stay home. And then there are star seeds who hold the indigo code, which I do. I'm very, I need to decode the information. I need to decode the download. I can't just sit, sit there and be in my heart and be like, all right, what's next? You know, I need to get the download. I need to go into the spirit realm and then break it down. I need to decipher everything. That's the indigo. The indigo in me wants to implement the change. Oh yeah, you definitely decipher everything. I do, I do. So, so, and then the other thing I want to share is I agree with you that the future doesn't exist from one viewpoint. So from the multidimensional viewpoint, there is no such thing as time. From the linear standpoint, from the third dimensional standpoint, you have to go pick up your kids at school at 4 p.m. So time yeah. doesn't exist, but time does exist. And you're right when you say you're creating as you speak, abracadabra, right? Yeah. So you're creating as you speak. And um, that, how I view that is, yes, that is 100% true. But if anything, you're um, fulfilling your mission that you signed up for before you were even born. So it was already created at the template level. And when you speak, you plant those energies, you anchor those energies. So in a way, we're all anchoring units and everything that we do that is in alignment with integrity, that is in alignment with truthfulness, with honesty, with modesty, with all of that, that actually plants the energy into the ground. Interesting. So it's like gardening. Yeah, I it, like It's that. the same thing gardening. as gardening. I love gardening. But, but how I... How I view things is there are a multitude or even an infinite amount of potential timelines, just like you said. There are infinite timelines. And I will choose to create things and I will also destroy things. To many people out there, I may be dark. I may be a dark magician because if they're trying to manipulate me psychically, I won't let that in. And then they're going to go home and tell their friends, that guy's dark, blah, 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 just because I didn't engage in their, their misery. So light and dark is relative. And when we can see it from the overview, as in we're both, we're the creator and the destroyer, we're destroying the old templates of reality that are, are no, no longer congruent with where we're headed as a humanity, that once served. Those old templates did serve. So they're not dark, they're just archaic. And then we're also the creator because we're, we're sharing positivity, we're uplifting people, we're synchronizing and harmonizing with all these amazing ideas. So we're both. We're the creator, we're also the destroyer. Yeah, we call that the, um, the Magnus um, 
it's the it's the it's the Magnus. It's the it's the it's the, it's the true wizard, the sorcerer, yes. who is on one hand is destruction, and on the other hand is creation. Yeah. And we are deciding the which implementation of that energy do we actually use. That's why I have this whole thing when people call themselves like the White Witch or Wiccans and things like that. In shamanism, we don't have that. We yeah. have we we see the Magnus and we see the understanding of the wizard, the one who thinks, and then it's created. But we look at these things need to come undone because a lot of times people will say, oh, you know, it's love and light, love and light, love and light. And I'm like, okay. And I, and I hear that a lot when I'm traveling, especially being I'm in LA and people are like love and lighters and they're just love and lighting everything. And I go, that's beautiful. And I think that's wonderful, love and light. But in shamanism, the way we look at love and light is we look at love and light in the aspect of con- confrontation with opposition. Mm-hmm. So we utilize the confrontation like, and it's one of my favorite things to do is to like confront the darkness, confront the sinister mm-hmm. thing, confront that with love to stand as a love and lighter in the position of holding the frequency of love, holding the frequency of light while darkness is trying to, or whatever the energy is that's that's in opposition and just keep beaming love onto it until mm-hmm. it actually changes its own structure back into light. Sure. And, um, and, and just through the, just through mere observance, it's shaping, it's, sh- it's shifting its structure as well. So being the love and the light, is in itself sh- uh, shifting the structure. Because I agree with you. I look at the dark. I look at everything because you have a lot of light workers out there who are like love and light and they don't see the boundary. Like I'm reading a book right now. Like I don't want to be talked to right now. <laughs> so <laughs> why are you talking? So they're not picking up on that higher, ha- that because they're in that moment, they're serving themselves. It's not so much about, it might be a seek for val- uh, seek, uh, seeking validation or right. seeking some sort of acknowledgement. So I will nip it. I love doing that stuff because I can see how it has a chain reaction. So if someone asks me to do something and I timeline jump, I love to timeline jump into what would happen if I said no to them Ooh, there's a reaction there. Say it. Say no. No. <laughs> right? Yeah. Stoke the fire. Get right. it going because then it's going to catalyze something within them that's unaddressed, untransmuted, and they may go tell their own friend and blah, 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 but it's all an opportunity. So yes, I, I would consider myself a sorcerer in that respect. I, I, love I that. work with both. I love it. I love it because it's, it's, uh, it's very powerful. And I think that you know, for me, you know, I'm a spirit shaman. So spirit shamans, Mm -hmm. the way we're raised or the way we're trained is we're trained to act, learn how to travel through different stargates, different dimensional gates and meet with other spirits such as like tree spirits or nature um, held on holder spirits or Jera spirits or, you know, jinn spirits. Like we want to, we meet with as many spirits as we can as kids and we learn how to respect them. Mm Mm-hmm to understand their dimension, how they think, how they operate, and the knowledge they have. And we just keep ourselves open to them. And then they build a a relationship with us. And so then when we come back into the physical world, I can say to someone, I can, someone's sitting there and I can say, "Um, tree spirit, build a rooting system through their system, go into their DNA, bring their energy from the roots of the tree and change this, change this, change that. And the tree spirits will come in and do those things because we have this long relationship Mm -hmm. with each other. But but then there's other shamans who are just focused on plant medicine. There's other shamans who are focused on just uh, ceremonial rituals, and other shamans like in Bali who do basically work with the water um, and the water uh, symbols for water magic. But I love I love listening to you because it really um, takes and captivates. Uh, a beautiful essence of energy because I, you know, in shamanism, we have these very ground rooted things, but it's mm-hmm. also nice because you're, you're up here in this different, uh, I want to say different, but just on a different stratosphere mm-hmm. that we shamans see and we love and you, you speak so eloquently and the way, so it's really good because you're really, you really are decoding Thank information yeah. for, for the general masses. I appreciate that. Yeah. Yes. I, I do find that these different entities or these different spirits within the astral realm, they are no nonsense. So when I work with the cobras, they do not want you to to have your tail between your legs. Like they want you to stand up to them. So very much in line with what you were saying, you have to oppose them and stand up to them, still respect them because they're giving you information. So you want to give thanks for that. But I see it as a tube that connects you guys. And then they're able to funnel energy to you and you're able to funnel energy through them. I mean, there are times where I meditate where I feel like an alien is coming into my body and gets to feel what it's like to be a human. And I'm in their spaceship and there's this beautiful 
beautiful exchange of energy that takes place, but they are no nonsense. And I think the key is to be able to look at everything, everything with um, acuity, everything with this this scanning or this this very zoomed in third eye where you don't fear anything anymore. And that's when you can really operate from the zero point field. That's when you can really be a master of these wizardry activities and so on, because you're not attached to the programs anymore. You can see right through them. So then you can go have fun and play. Um, but certainly there are people who get trapped in the astral realm because they open up their mind. They have an, uh, an initial awakening and then Jesus comes to visit them. And then they think that they're Jesus now. <laughs> I've run into a lot of, those. a lot of people. And so, and, and the thing is, that's why discernment is so essential yes. when you're working with these energies, because if you say something like I am Jesus, or I am the reincarnated version of Einstein, it's not, it, it, I'm not saying it's not true. So I don't want to negate that. It, it could be true, but when you're fully in alignment, you don't share that information. You don't disclose that. And then usually it means that there's some sort of a parasite or an astral being. And I stay away from parasites because they're just astral beings and they're really trying to teach you how to not be Jesus. <laughs> but when you learn how to navigate the astral realm, the spirit world with an open third eye, where you see everything, all the activity, you have almost like a, a a hat and the brim has eyes all over it, all around it. And you can pay attention to everything that's going on. That's when you can wear your badge of sovereignty. But if you don't have your badge of sovereignty, there will be other entities that can hijack you, that can make you think that you're Jesus so that you can f siphon other people's energies. Yeah. You know, they snack on that. They love to snack on that energy. They gather up, they harvest all these, these energies through people. Yep. And then, and then they grab their energy. But these astral beings aren't bad. Yeah. You know, it, I, I want to expound on that because, you know, in, um, in shamanism, we believe that a human being is, is a composite of many spirits that have chosen to create them all together so that they all can create um, a vast energy field mm -hmm. to all those lives. So for instance, for me, when I was a kid, my father was beating me. And at one point I had kissed his feet and begged for mercy. And he kicked me off of his foot and he said, no mercy. And he kept beating me. And I was until I passed out. And when he did that, I saw myself in Egypt and I saw myself sitting there as Amun Ra and there was this taskmaster beating a slave in front of me. And he went and grabbed my left foot and begged for mercy. And I kicked them off of my foot. Mm. And, um, and so I saw all of it, you know, in front of me. And I remember when my sister said to me, why do we get these intense beatings? You know, and I said, you don't remember. You don't remember who we were. And as a kid, it was always there. And I, and I feel it. Like when I'm working sometimes with people, I start, I, when I was in, living in Cairo, I was speaking, um, talking to this guy and I started saying things. And he goes, you know, he goes, it's really interesting. You seem like a pharaoh. You have a very pharaoh energy to you. And I go, why do you say that? He goes, I can feel it because I'm Egyptian. I, can, I feel something inside of you. And when I was doing healing work on him, all of a sudden I started speaking Egyptian. And I was walking down the street and I, I started getting angry when I saw the Sphinx's nose missing. And I remember walking down the street and people were following me down the street. And my friend who was visiting from Italy goes, why? He wanted to ask the people, why are you following my friend? And they said, he has the energy of one of the ancients. Mm -hmm. So I see the different aspects. Like I was a geisha in one life. That's why I have this complete knowledge of like, you know, servicing um, and energy and like, you know, these very intricate ways of service and pleasure and ecstasy. And then I was also a concubine. Mm -hmm. So that's a lot of my work for women empowerment comes from my torture from the Spaniards, from the black robes when they took me um, and classified me as a witch, you know, and my life as a um, living in the countryside in the country time with my horse and my farm when I got sick with this, um, this horrible, what you would call emphysema today was, you know, took my life at a very young age. But that's why I have this intense love for, for Western movies and cowboy and all that. But all of these different spirits that make me who I am, I can hear them talking to me. Yes. 
And, you know, but I don't go around going, I am Almond Raw. Like it's, they've embodied the new me and and created the new me. And so I have all their abilities, you know, so I can, I sense myself, I sense when they're coming out, like when I'm speaking to a group of women, I can feel the woman inside who was tortured and had her cut, her tongue cut out and her mouth soldered by the, by the Spaniards come and speak to them about how we're going to rise up and get back and take and stay in that place of sisterhood and never let these things happen again. Or if I'm talking to someone and they're like friends the other day, my friend came over as DJ and I was doing some work on him. And then he's like, I'm so tired. I have no energy. And I said, hold on one second. And I called in this, um, this, uh, scarab into his body to, to replenish his energy. And then I mm-hmm. asked Anubis and Isis and Sakmet to hold the chambers. All of a sudden his body started vibrating and he's like, oh my God, I have full energy. He's like, how do you do that? And I said, it comes from that part of my lifetime when I was, um, Pharaoh, I used to work a lot with the priestesses and their sacrifices and rituals. So I feel like there's some people on earth because I don't want them to get confused with the idea that if these things are coming through them, but then there are these cuckoo energies that I see where like I met this guy once who basically, you know, I came home to my house and he was capped out in my backyard and he had said to me that he was the new Messiah and that he was Jesus incarnate and that he has come to heal and that he needed me to follow him because he saw me on TV or something like this. And it's those energies. It's those, and, and I think you're, you're right. I mean, it, it could be true that someone is Jesus reincarnated and you have affiliations with Egypt. By the way, my family is born in Egypt, so I'm Egyptian. So you and I probably hung out back then and smoked shisha or something. <laughs> I love it. Magila. Uh, we spoke Magila. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so definitely it could be true. Like I can say to you that from one viewpoint, I'm... Uh, Toth and Hermes because they were the same and Merlin who, right. who was the same I can tell you that that I come that I was them but I'm also from that lineage which is true and from a different viewpoint it's how is that person making you feel because if you're not integrated as a being then you're still serving self Yes. how is the person making you feel do they make you feel are they putting the spotlight on you making you feel good or are they making it about them Yes, And if they're self-absorbed, you're going to feel it because it feels like a suction cup yes, or a vacuum. That's right. So the idea is um, if you have that information, it could be true, but then making sure that you integrate those energies. That's what I want. Yeah. It's that's, integration. That's and and this is. entire ascension process is about integration. It's about bringing the non-physical realms down into the physical. It's about, about merging antimatter with matter. It's about merging the physical with the spirit. It's all about that. But it's funny because you can have someone, you know, when you see someone on the street who's like almost like in their ego, like they're like, you know, they're, they're too cool for school and they're walking like really fast, like they're trying really hard. Well, that could be that there's a spirit trying to merge with them a spirit of masculinity, a spirit of no-nonsense, royal energy. Here I am. This is my power. But they haven't integrated. So when I see people like that on the street, I just see like a spirit that they haven't learned how to integrate yet. Yes. Does that make sense? Absolutely. I was at the gym one day and I saw this woman running around. You know how they have those... those uh, those uh, tr- those tracks at the top of the gym and they go around yes. like at the YMCA. And she was running... And I could tell she had uh, some sort of a eating disorder or something. And I saw this like spirit on on top of her left shoulder that was whispering in her ear, say, run faster, run faster, run faster. And she was running faster because she was under the governance of this other entity. Mm -hmm. This other entity may not be bad, but she's supposed to understand what it's trying to teach her. And then they can become one. But usually it's very apparent to me when someone hasn't done the integration work because they say things like, oh, shaman, follow me. I know I have something huge in store for me. You know, it's not integrated. <laughs> it's not integrated. So it's all about embodiment. And if you're not embodying those highest, those higher octaves of who you are, you might be able to fool a few people, but not people who do the work. People who are able to see through the, the deception, they will see right through you. And I'm usually someone who will call it out. Yeah, I call, call it out. out. I call it out. Because I'm not interested in that dance, in that elephant in the room. I'm going to nip it. 
So yeah, I think it's important, and I think you know, like we and we we do a lot of discernment. That's a part of a lot of our training is discernment, and also being able to um, interrogate. We call it loving interrogation. Mm-hmm. So we interrogate every spirit that talks to us. That's great. So if a spirit starts, starts, starts telling me, "Oh yeah, I'm this spirit, and I came from this underworld being a place," and da-da-da, then I go, "Okay, do you serve love?" And it goes, "Yeah." I go, "How do you serve love?" And it mm. tells me, and then I go, "Okay." And how do you use that love? And what's the purpose of you serving that love? Mm-hmm. And I just, I just ask a lot of questions. And that, by that, by a certain point, if the spirit is coming as a parasite or whatever, it trips up its questions. Mm-hmm. And then when I deal with a person who has the, the spirits inside of them, I'll do the same thing. I go ask, ask the spirit if it's if it if it's uh, here to serve humanity on its highest level, mm-hmm. and then it says yes, okay, and ask how it's doing that. Mm-hmm. And then it's quiet. I said, the spirit went quiet all of a sudden. Mm-hmm. They're like, I don't hear anything anymore, Shaman Durek. Mm-hmm. I go, well, I go, ask the spirit why it's not answering you. And it's like, it's still not answering me. Mm-hmm. I said, ask the spirit if it's scared. And then it, it said, and then the person will say, oh, the spirit says it doesn't get scared. I said, okay, so it is scared. Mm-hmm. So, and I, and I break it down. And I think because interrogation is important in shamanic love, because in shamanism, the way that we are, taught as kids is the first thing we learn is to identify God, identify creation. Mm -hmm. And so we do that by them sending us out into nature. Then they ask us, do you know who God is? Do you know who creation is? And if we come back and we have this idea that it's like this kind of like thing that you can actually touch and put into like a very materialistic way, Mm -hmm. um, we don't have the answer yet. So then they ask us again. And when we finally come back and say, you know, creation is the essence of all things. So it is the tree, it is the flower, it is the, it is the, in the, it's the non and the, in, in the created, it's, it's everything. So we see it as the creation. And so we look at everything from the state of, not from the personality state that human beings like to put on God or creation. Mm-hmm. We see it from creation. Yes. So that's just it. So every time someone, so when we talk about manifesting something, we don't talk about it in the, I'm going to do this, we say, oh, it was lovely how I did such and such and such and such. I do the same thing. I feel like I create it at the snap of a finger, but if I do it at the snap of a finger, I didn't get to to witness how it all came about. And then I just, (laughs) it's almost like if you take a rolling pin to make pizza (laughs) and you roll the dough, because you want to see, you want to stretch your reality to see what, how it came about. That's what I do too. It's almost like a, my own, I'm the director of the script, I'm the editor and the actor. And as the third dimensional actor, I want to see how the movie played out. Yeah. Um, but it, it, it was all conjured up within, you know, millisecond. That's why I think it's good to align ourselves with spirits that you resonate with. Like I resonate with Merlin the Magician. I resonate with the Cobras and I know how to go take myself there now. It's like you activate the Stargate and you move into that astral realm or into that inner living room or inner sanctuary and you get working. It's like a school. It's just that it's an esoteric school. It's not, it's an invisible school. Can I bring up the word resonate? Because, um, yeah. you know, so I've been doing a lot of meditation on this work because I hear a lot of people say, I resonate with this and I don't resonate with that. So we have this thing in in the way that we're trained is that anything that your mind goes to, you're resonating with. Mm -hmm. So we have this like, like if someone says, a woman said to me, oh, I don't resonate with that negative stuff. I go, yeah, actually you do. Because you, that's why your mind was sent there. Now, the part that sent your mind there, you need to find out why it went there. Even though you say you're not resonating with it there's a part of your being that saw it, which means that it's showing it to you. Exactly. Right? It's in your field of consciousness. How I would liken that is, I would liken that to every frequency you hold within the cellular structure of your body acts as a magnet for what you're attracting externally. So if you hold the frequency of anger, you're going to attract a lot of angry people in your life until you learn how to, I guess, revoke that contract or you learn how to neutralize that charge. So every frequency you hold within your body, if it's joy, you're going to have a lot of joy in your life. If it's a lot of generosity, you're going to have no problem bringing in money um, and so forth and so forth. But can't we just say that because when someone says that they resonate with something, like if they say, oh, I don't resonate with people who act like that, that means they do because their attention's upon it. Because in shamanism, the way we look at it is that wherever your attention yeah. sees, your energy goes. Exactly. So if it was able to pair up with your reality, it means that there's a frequency that you hold within that had it magnetized to you. 
So there is something within it, a, a lesson that's concealed mm -hmm. in it that you need to unzip or <laughs> to figure out what that lesson is. That's why I wanted to say it that way, because yeah. I knew that if I say it, uh, and that's the way that, you know, certain ways that, that we see it, the yeah. way that I was trained, then you'll be able to decipher it into a way. To interpret it differently. Uh, yes. And that's why I see beauty in the Lucifer. I see beauty in all of it, because if I'm working with my, my inner darkness, if you will, and I go on the street and... And <laughs> this just came to me. It'll sound a little strange. But say that I use baby wipes. Mm -hmm. And I go out there and I say, <laughs> no one's used baby wipes today. Well, I'm going to pull in all this these shame programs that are still lurking within the collective mind. And then you could say that that's dark on my part, but I'm utilizing that darkness to pull in information to then quarantine it. Are you saying baby wipes like for your yeah, bum? Yeah, for your bum. Oh yeah, so I need it, baby wipes so, too. So if you do, but so if you work with that, if you go, all right, well, I'm using baby wipes. No one today has used baby wipes. Well, you're going to tune into the shame collective. That's and right. then within that collective of shame programs, you can go in and like you said, inter interrogate it, investigate it like a spiritual inspector gadget, and you can dissect every little energy that you receive. And then you're observing from the zero point field. You're observing from that space of neutrality. And when you observe from the zero point field, there are no emotions. You're just collecting data. That's the, right. You're the bone collector. <laughs> so, <laughs> so there's beauty in all of it. You know, yes. um, if you see a, a beautiful woman walk into a, a room and she exudes confidence, I'm sure a lot of women are going to feel insecure. But guess what? That woman is helping you. That woman is triggering something within you that you haven't resolved yet. So is it dark? Spiritual high five. Is it dark? Boom. Spiritual high five. Is it dark? Exactly. Or is it just catalyzing something in with, within you that you have intended to yet? Exactly. So um, if anything, if you feel insecure, going back to your example, like, oh, well, if they're not resonating with that girl, it means there's something in it for them. Absolutely there is. Because if the woman brings about a feeling of insecurity or lack of worthiness within them, they need to start looking at what's lacking within them and then go in and maybe learn from that woman or connect with that woman's energy because that woman is obviously positively impacting people around her and then um, connect with that energy as you would connect with a snake or a cobra or an ET and then learn from that. It doesn't mean you have to become that, but you at least integrate that energy to become more balanced. Yeah, we definitely love, I love the, the silent observer the mm -hmm. observer who's watching and seeing the energies that are actually appearing. It's really easy. I mean, I think it's really easy for, for us to be able to understand our world if we truly want to understand our world. Yes. If we really want to understand it, all we really have to do, like when people talk about mindfulness, you know, sometimes I, I, I get people who come to me, oh yeah, I meditate. And I go, what do you do in your meditation? They go, oh, I just keep, I, I clear everything out of my head. In shamanism, and I just, and I, and the reason why I say in shamanism, because these are the things that I learned growing up as a kid. So I'm just giving you from my understanding. Yeah. That's why I like Phil to be able to decipher it in, mm -hmm. in different ways. We have this understanding that when you meditate inside, like to clear things out of your head, you're, you're, you're taking, you're disrupting the channels that are coming through, through you that have informational data that you need to learn how to interface with mm -hmm. to understand that hey, there's a part of you that has a judgment towards that. Or, hey, there's this part that is asking for love from you more. Yes. And so when we shut all that out, you know, and even just that, but even just like where people go to meditate near a brook or a stream or a waterfall, in shamanism, we're told by our elders to go meditate in the most disruptive, mm -hmm. destructive, most loud, intense place because it builds our spiritual immune system. Sure. Absolutely. And it will. And that's why it's important to work with the introvert and the extrovert within you. I think of the Kundalini, the serpent, when I, when I work with it, sometimes I let it take over me. That's more of the introspective divine feminine energy, right? I'm letting it take over me and penetrate my field. And then sometimes I work with grabbing it by the neck or charming it like a snake charmer and looking it directly in the eyes which is more of the masculine, boom, I'm locking you down. Masculine, very active, is able to scan, zoom into truth, zoom into misalignments. And then there are times where we make a deal where it'll travel through my body and I'm not allowed to touch it and it's not allowed to touch me. We just look at each other. So which would be more of the neutral. So with everything in life, yes, the, ideally would be to work with more of the introspective, but then also send yourself out because that's as spiritual 
you're learning how to thicken your skin. You're learning how to fortify your spiritual immune system and work with people like work with have friends that are a little more um, entrepreneurial who aren't spiritual at all, but know how to banter. That's really good to align yourself with people who are very in the base chakra and they're very good at like bantering or putting you in your place when you don't speak your truth or when you're afraid to speak your truth. Surround yourself with people who are more masculine driven, but also take the time to resort to your inner oasis and meditate and send yourself to different realms. I can't just be in my heart all the time because if you're always in your heart, people might take advantage of you. You need the heart coupled with the third eye. If you don't have discernment, your your heart is futile. You need both. You need to be in your heart, but then when you send yourself into those love levels or into those different spaces or those different stratospheres, like you said earlier, are you going to be able to discern what's coming through? So the heart is great, but it's not enough. Yeah. If you have an open heart and you want to help everyone, everyone might take advantage of you or expect you to be there for them all the time, and then you're doing it to your own expense. It's about having your heart and a, a, an actively open third eye. They have to work together. I'm so glad that you're and saying that. And when people say it's just heart-centered, that is completely removed from the, <laughs> from the truth. <laughs> completely. So, so another example would be, yes. you, you need the mind. But the mind isn't enough. The mind keeps this reality, the game of duality alive. The mind is a device that is supposed to make this reality seem real. It's here to separate, to segregate. That's what it does. The mind can also be domesticated to be something amazing. But the mind in itself is not enough. You need the heart, but you also need the, the third eye. They all have to work in tandem. You know, I'm glad that you said that. You know, one of the things that I always really want people to understand is that the reason why the mind and the body constructs itself to this idea of duality and so forth is because the body belongs to earth mm -hmm. and the and the mitochondria in your body, the way that your body reads synthesis, the mitochondria, these little bacteria inside of your body that make you work, make your body work, they are tuned to the earth energy and the earth energy is a about some, you know, preservation, mm -hmm. whereas the spirit doesn't have the need for preservation. So there's, a, there's the, the, what happens with us because we took on this, um, this uh, biological spacesuit. We borrowed these, 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 you know, these microscopic um, beings who are thinking and. Uh, operating the earth energy through us. So their spirits, our heart, our, our liver, our lungs, our organs, they're all living spirits. But those living spirits don't think in the same way that your spirit thinks. Mm -hmm. And so that's where people get this, this disconnect because in Germanism, we say that if your body is a, make, a, a multiple of all these bacteria, this mitochondria, these responses that are these living bacteria in your body that are creating this whole networking system and the whole networking system is to, to stay alive, mm -hmm. preserve, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Stay alive, mm -hmm. preserve, fear of death, fear of death, fear of mm -hmm. death, because it knows that it's not eternal. Right. Right. But the spirit is. Yes. So the spirit is downloading into the body, but the mitochondria and the rest of the body is going, what? No, we need to keep yes. the preservation. And so that's where people get stuck because they don't understand that we have to outsmart those those bacteria in our body mm -hmm. by getting our frequency up in the body yes. you know so that we can bring more light frequency in the body that talks to those those bacteria and says hey you are not you're not um, eternal, but I'm eternal. And you have mm -hmm. to understand that I'm here to usher this information into you so that mm -hmm. we can sustain and do what we've come to do. But eventually this body will die, but the spirit won't. And the body knows that. The body knows. And also the body, everything that you learn will get encoded into your DNA. So you will, when you come back or when you go to the next life, everything that you've learned obviously will carry forward. If you've learned how to make money in this life, you'll never have to struggle again in another life. Life, but we are here to descend the higher self into the physical body, just like we are here to descend the fifth dimensional crystalline grid into the third dimensional artificial grid system of control. So that's what we're doing. And if we're only looking at the light, <laughs> then we're not going to be able to look at those bacteria and say, look, like I'm trying to help you and help us. So work with me here. Um, and so, yes, we've been deeply embedded with these programs. You can call them bacteria. You can call them chips, microchips, uh, etheric uh, implants, whatever you choose to call them. We've been deeply programmed. And now the higher frequency light is illuminating those 
potholes of darkness within us so that we can look at them and then either cast them away or either transmute them or whatever it is that we need to do to become more embodied. That's what we're here to do, is to anchor those higher dimensional light codes. Absolutely. So, you know, when we talk about anchoring these energies into the being, Mm -hmm. one of the things that darkness did to dismantle that anchoring Mm -hmm. was to remove and to crucify and to make uncomfortable the feminine aspects of our nature. Mm -hmm. Because by taking away the feminine aspect, because see, in masculine, masculine sees everything in linear form. Right. So if you take a really masculine male and you give him a bunch of problems, he's going to solve those problems based upon his linear understanding Understanding and his understanding of how problem solving operates from his perspective of life, things he's learned, things he's experienced. You take a feminine perspective on those same problems, and it's not going to be given, the same information is not going to be um, given based on those problems. It's going to be based upon intuition. It's going to be based upon information that can, can like, taken back way back in ancestry, Mm -hmm. right? And so women see the world and the feminine energy operates a quantum field. And it's been proven scientifically by amazing people like Paul Hawken. And there's all these great scientists that um, have been able to measure the level of masculine perception versus the feminine perspective. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, in shamanism, especially in African shamanism in Ghana and West Africa, where my family's tribe comes from, you know, we have this belief that, quote unquote, where people say gay people, you know, are not gay people. We, we call them the fifth element. They're mm. the ones who are to usher in the energy of the feminine energy and they're ushering in the imbalance of the masculine. And they're supposed to shift those energies into a bridge that bridges both masculine and feminine to be in uh, synergy with each other and then open up a gateway to our consciousness to lead us into a new world, a Mm -hmm. new design, a new uh, perception, a new creative understanding and all of these different things. But because the feminine has been pushed down, darkness has infiltrated that as the first ketone Mm -hmm. of breaking down the energy frequencies that make it difficult for people to anchor in. Because in shamanism, to become a shaman, you have to have certain gifts. And one of the things you have to be able to have is the ability to step into your feminine energy, your ability to step into your masculine energy, your ability to be a child, your ability to be un- unhinged, meaning like you, you don't, you don't buy into systems. Mm-hmm. You are mm-hmm. you 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 look at them, you see them, and you're like, ha ha ha, I'm a rebel, you know. And you'll go do something completely different yeah. than what the tribe would do. Yeah. And so this is how we choose who's the next shaman. This is how the spirits will choose them. The feminine energy is is lifting, but what do you think people can do to to lift it even more so we can really anchor that light in? I would say with the feminine, start working with your creative energy more. Also, whenever you're feeling the impulse to go control something, that's your masculine coming online. Instead, open up your heart and usher in more of that grace, more of that feminine attribute, because it doesn't matter. Like if we go into um, genderless, right? It's not really masculine, feminine. It is, but it's also love and it's light. Love would be the feminine. Light would be the masculine. Magnetic would be the feminine. The feminine is very magnetic in nature. Yes. The electric would be the masculine, um, the dark and the light. So what we want to do, and the dark, the masculine would be the dark, obviously, because it's the active. Um, I would say whenever you, at a practical level, whenever you feel impulsed to go try to fix someone or control something, instead, scale back and let that energy pour in. Because you can't enslave someone. You know, like if you, what you can do is you can coerce them into moving or walking towards this cage. And then they're like, oh, you're locked. You're mine now. But you really can't control people. I would take my life before someone takes over me. So the, the, <laughs> I the, love you. <laughs> the thing is, the thing is, um, it was set up this way and, and it's an intricate design. So say that the, the feminine was too magnetic and then the, the male took over her and then she allowed that. And then she started repressing, repressing, repressing. And now she's like, where the hell am I? I haven't spoken. I haven't chased my dreams. And all this creativity just attracted this man. And this man has now engulfed me. And now I, I've lost myself. We can't blame it on the masculine because you had the magnetic quality that then attracted the masculine. 
So we can't go on the other end of the spectrum now and get too aggressive with the masculine because you allowed it. You allowed it. So it's a matter of finding that balance within yourself, holding yourself responsible. If you've been in an abusive relationship where someone was gaslighting you, you allowed it. And we use things, the terms like narcissists and all that. And in a thousand years, we won't use words like that. Yeah. Because I, I don't know who's a narcissist because I'm not a vibrational match to that. <laughs> so it's not a part of my reality. <laughs> exactly. It's, you only call it a narcissist if it's been a part of your reality, which means that going back to your resonance example, there's something that you were holding within your body that led to that. Yeah. And now you're calling that person a narcissist. We're going to eventually come out and cycle out of all these judgments because even calling someone a narcissist from the overview is not holding someone in the highest light of awareness uh, of and protecting their energy. I'm all about protecting people's energies. Yeah. So even if someone's like a killer, we don't judge that. Yeah, we, go call through, it, we call it don't frame them. Don't frame them. That's great. I love that. So so getting out of these words like narcissist because that keeps you in the cycle. It's a It's a loop cycle. And that's going to prevent the divine feminine from uprising and healing the collective. The divine feminine is very much like the Shakti. She's going to start to move up through the spinal cord of Mother Earth and clear away all those residues, clear away all those leftovers. That's what her job is. But we have to get out of the way. Because when my Kundalini first awakened, I fought it and I resisted it and it, it, she became more aggressive. Because she was trying to pin me down in a headlock and be like, hey, I'm trying to help you here. <laughs> like, just surrender to me. So whenever you're wanting to control things, just surrender. Let it happen. And you'll know. You have to learn how to shut up before you can speak. <laughs> you yeah. Know? You have to learn how to be quiet before you can speak. I wasn't speaking my truth until I learned how to clear my impurities. And the divine feminine allowed, it, allowed me to do that. And then once you do that, then the sacred masculine starts to emerge from the depth of your soul, and then you can go out and be of service to humanity. But first, we have to get, get out of the way. That's the first phase. You awaken, you get out of the way, you allow for all those impurities to be reversed, to be undone, and then the sacred masculine steps in. Right. I call it, I, I always say that people are stubborn in, in, the, in all the wrong places. Mm -hmm. You know, they're stubborn when their information should, when they shouldn't be stubborn. They're mm -hmm. stubborn when there's a healing coming on to them and they shouldn't be stubborn in that place or mm -hmm. choose not to be stubborn in that place. They should be stubborn about not having enough money. You know, stubborn, mm -hmm. they should be stubborn about not putting up with people's drama or not putting up with abuse. Then you should be stubborn there, but not stubborn when the love is coming, when the healing exactly. is coming, when That's the transformation great. is coming. I like that. It's it's very interesting because people, you know, they are so powerful. You know, I I, I walk around this earth. I I go to these different countries. You know, even when I'm in Muslim countries, and I tell all of my the women that I work with, I said, you know, if you all walked out tomorrow, your men wouldn't know what to do. Mm -hmm. You know, so there's <laughs> <laughs> so every time you think like you're being controlled and you're having this power you know, your power is being taken and all of these things, you're basically handing it over. You're pretty, and then you're putting the blame on someone else. Yeah. I mean, you, we can't do that anymore. And, and the truth, and I've been teaching people how to be a dot. It's something I came up two weeks ago. Just be a dot. The, what happened in the past has nothing to do with what's happening now. And what's happening in the future isn't existing right now. So just be a dot. You know, when people start CrossFit, they don't want to go to the gym. They're like, ah, this is new to me. I don't want to work with this energy, blah, blah. And then a month later, they have like an aha moment or something clicks in and they're like, I like this. Higher consciousness is the same thing. It's not easy. You don't just get out of victimhood. You have to work with the energy. You hold it. It's like holding your breath under the water. You hold it, hold it, hold it, and eventually locks in. So if people learn how to work with the higher consciousness, it's truly like in training to a new way of being. But do you think, let me ask you this, bro. Do you think that because, you know, I was looking at this, this thought one day. I asked a friend, where do you want to eat? She always eats at sushi, this one restaurant. And then she says, I go, do you want to go back to that restaurant? She says, no, I don't want to go to that restaurant. I said, why? She goes, I changed my mind. I don't want to eat there anymore. Mm -hmm. I'm changing where I want to eat. I want to get into Indian food. So I've been eating at this Indian restaurant. I said, okay. okay. But then all of a sudden she has this situation happen in her life. And I said, okay, well, just change your thought on it and do something different. But they... She's like, oh, no, I have to work on it. I have to do this thing. I have to do this thing to get to it. Why do you think human beings create these very, they can make quick decisions when it comes to changing their toothpaste, not eating at that restaurant. I don't want to listen to this song anymore. These are just choices. Mm -hmm. Yet, when it comes to the choice to make a decision between taking in something, you know, like 
empowering yourself through words versus not empowering yourself through words. They feel like they have to go to like landmark forum. They have to go to this thing. They have to work on themselves. They have to go through all of this intensity mm-hmm. to just make another decision. Yeah. I think that the, the problem is people are, are busy making choices. When you're aligned with spirit, you don't need to make a choice. Spirit chooses for you. People to, pe- one person asked me like, do you do this for people? I said, I do it because I don't have a choice. (laughs) It's my calling. So when you're aligned with spirit, you don't need to choose things. And even with the example of your friend, if she's like, oh, I usually go to the sushi restaurant. Why are you even saying that then? Just choose the Indian restaurant, commit to it. I, I, instead of choosing, you're deciding. I'm deciding to have Indian tonight. Boom. And I think a lot of people still don't fully trust that they have the answers. They don't fully trust it yet. And it takes work. And there is no shortcut. You have to be willing to dedicate your time to working on your third eye. The third eye is a stargate. (laughs) You can travel to all these different dimensions with your third eye. But I think a lot of the reason is that people are tied up in the trapping systems. The trapping systems have been infiltrated or they've infiltrated the lower third dimensional all the way up to the lower fourth dimensional. Be, uh, realm. So someone could um, entertain the thought of having Indian, and then they time travel to having Indian, to the potential of having Indian, and then an astral being can clamp them and be like, oh, this is what you want. And then they're fighting that now. So there's all these trapping systems that have been inserted in the mix to keep you from being sovereign, to keep you from thinking for yourself. And people need to start opening up their eyes to to the un, un realm, to I'm sorry, to the unseen realms, because if they don't, they're always going to be under the governance of something. Exactly, exactly. We call it the hidden transmission. Yeah, and it's uh, it's interesting that you said that, and I'm so glad that you did because, you know, when I'm going around and loving people and servicing them and teaching them shamanism, because see, I'm not just here to just have sessions with people and whatever. I came here very specifically when I was going through my training as a kid. My elders used to always say to me things like, um, you know, not everyone is going to understand these things. So you don't give them everything because it may be too much. And every time I hear like my friends in India or different spiritual teachers, they're like, you can't give everything to everyone. You have to give them little bits of pieces and so forth until they can be able to understand this information. And then they can go to the next level and graduate. I said, well, you know, why don't we just teach them what we know? Like, why am I giving them information? Why don't I show them how to draw electricity from midair? Why don't I show them how to tap into another dimension and walk into that dimension with full spectrum? We call spectral your third eye. Mm -hmm. And full spectrum and full audio tone to be able to see, hear, and feel in their body while they're in that dimension. Why don't I just show it to them? And it's interesting because the old adage of teaching from shamanism to guruism to, you know, any form of spiritual um, art or diocese was based on this idea that you had to earn based on what you're doing to be given more information, Mm -hmm. where I feel like the veil or what I, what I feel myself, and you can tell me if you, what you feel about it. I feel like for my life, I don't want to be the only one who has these abilities. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be the only one who's able to communicate to other beings or open up stargates and and pull into other worlds and so forth. I want to be, I feel safer on a planet knowing that everyone is activated or there's more people activated Mm -hmm. and get out of that guru, that old guru way, which is like disciples and like, you're my disciple and I'm Mm -hmm. giving you the little bits and crumbs until you can show me that, you know, you have long devotion into these crumbs and then I'm going to give you a a cracker. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm more into the idea that we are in a free informational highway spiritually and that people need to get into the invisible world, not just for the sake of glorification of, oh, I spoke to my spirit guides, I'm so cool, or I know how to do this and I'm so cool, to understanding that these, that the energy of going into this indivisible plane is for your evolution. Mm-hmm. It will happen in time. I feel like right now people are working with their own blueprint because we architected our blueprint before we were born, all of us. So when you created the problem, you also created the solution. People are where they want to be, whether it's unconsciously, subconsciously, or consciously. That's where they're they're a match. That's what's the right 
fit for them at this time. So you're doing your work, you know, you're spreading a lot of knowledge and that's, you are transmitting a lot of information to people that's being received. And then I'm doing the same and different people are doing the same. And then to get, it's going to happen in time though. I think it's something that can't be rushed because if I tell someone today to go and meditate for three hours, they're probably not going to do it unless they want to learn, then they will. Um, because you do earn keys. The more that you apply yourself, the spirit guides, they give you more keys to hidden dimensions. I found that to be true. Did you just say keys? Keys. We say that in shamanism. Do you? Yeah, we call them spiritual keys. Yeah, they're keys. Yeah, and you open up doorways to other worlds and other, and other powers, other gifts, other yeah. so forth. And sometimes you will have spirits attached onto you and you're still blind within that dimension. So I've often seen myself as a blind man in a different dimension. But if I have a spirit attached onto me, I, I, I learn like, okay, what's, what's not working here? And I look at it in the face eventually and I get a new key. Like that's how it works with more access. But people will come to their own realization in time. But right now we need to pioneer the higher consciousness. That's what we're here to do. And it will happen. It's just a matter of time. So, so right now in shamanism, we call this the blackout time. We call we, from the year 2012 for up to 20 to 15 years. There's a cycle that we go through on or on that we are saying it goes on. Or so with the with the equinox that happen, with the eclipse, with the dark eclipse, all of these are the signs of the blackout. And the blackout is a time where people have to quantumly lift their energy mm -hmm. because. The, the earth and all of these things are going to start showing up yeah. on the energies that we've actually been holding on to on the planet that have to be cleansed by Gaia. Mm -hmm. So a lot of shamans are getting this call around the world is to stop sugarcoating, stop sugarcoating, stop petting people and stroking them, but like really being like, look, you have no more time to play small. It's time to step into your power. So right. if that means uncomfortableness to you, that's got to be uncomfortable. And so we have been, um, the way that we're, uh, that shamans, when I'm meeting with other shamans around the world, we're not at the place anymore of going like, okay, you can work on your blueprint and do this and do that. Mm -hmm. We're more like, um, no more excuses, no more, no more games, no more playing small. You are a powerful creator. Now step into your power. Let's mm -hmm. see you step into your power. And they will because they're part of your reality. They're a match to you. And then other people may be a match to someone else. But what you're experiencing is also part of your reality bubble. So yes, it's good to be actively going out there and helping shift people, but they have to want to do it. They have to. And you're right. I mean, the veil is thinning now. So there is disclosure. We actually weren't supposed to share that this is an experiment. We weren't. We were supposed to come to that understanding on our own. Right. But because we're kind of like lagging, <laughs> people like me and you need to inform people like, hey, you guys need to pick up here. Right. You guys are that's, slacking. That's what I'm talking about. Exactly. So I think it's great that you're doing that. I think it's great that we're all doing it. We're, we're getting people to step it up. And it's going to come down to, can they tune into your podcast, but then take the time to really decipher it? and apply it <laughs> exactly. because people are overly distracted. That's why I have a policy with myself every day. I, my phone is on do not disturb like four or five hours a day because it takes dedication. It really does to get in tune to those subtleties. Even guided meditations are great, but do another meditation where there's no sound. Mute it out, drain out that sound. We're too distracted. So if people start taking the time to tune in, and tune out the noise, all that mayhem, then maybe we will start to ascend at a more acceler accelerated rate. But I feel like it's already happening. I feel like people are awakening by the millions now. And there's a, a genuine interest in higher consciousness. If you say to anyone, you create your reality, they've all heard that now. Yes. That already is like us growing by leaps and bounds. Yes. But it's that, you know, like for me, a lot of my work is dealing with like very powerful, like... Mm -hmm major people who are moving things on the planet, you know, and getting them to be able to understand the the level of power that they have available yeah. to them. Because it's really funny, you would be surprised when I sit down with some of these leaders in the world or like very powerful billionaires and millionaires who are like the leading people changing the, re the, the reality around people. They don't even realize the power that they have. Mm -hmm. 
Like when I say something to them, like, you know, wouldn't it be great if you just kind of like took some of these millions right now and did this and did this and helped these people and did that and whatever. And they're like, oh, I had no idea, (laughs) you know? (laughs) And then like when I talk to like, you know, like a celebrity who's just like, you know, like huge and they're just like, you know, everywhere in the tabloids and da, da, da. And I'm just like, it'd be kind of cool if you just started like engaging in meditation because people who watch you will start seeing that and they'll start engaging into it too. And you have, you've got like 3 million people on Instagram. (laughs) You can actually really shift a great, a lot of people. And they, this is what comes out of their mouth. Really? Uh, but you have to understand from the from the highest dimensional stand from the zero point field, which is absoluteness, is nothingness, it's the void. From the zero point field, there's no rush. From that field, there is no rush. People will get there. It's already been just like your manifestations. You already know what's coming. You may not tell people, your friends. I already know what's coming for me. I may not tell people. Right. But what's the rush? I'm in foreplay right now. It's foreplay cosmic foreplay. <laughs> so so on one hand, yes, we have to wake people up, but you can try to wake someone up and if they're not ready to receive the information, they just won't. Oh yeah, I agree with that 100%. Right? So I call it, it loving them unconditionally when, yeah. no matter where they're at. And they're going to synthetically apply the information not knowing what they're doing. It's like that kid that wants the lollipop and doesn't know why they have to behave. They just want the damn lollipop. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I think right now we're doing we're doing what we can especially with social media. It's been a great tool. It has to, been a great tool. To um, spread that information. And uh, and then the problem is a lot of people are a tool to the tool. They're, they, they're <laughs> being used by their phones. So if we can find that balance, at least educate people on finding that balance within them. All right, you've been on your phone enough today. Take a time out. Or you can be on your phone, but be mindful. Be aware, be in your body. I see so many people leaning into the screen. Like, hello, where are you? Like, you look like a zombie. Like, hold your own. <laughs> look at your phone or watch a TV show, but be aware of your body as you do so. But a lot of people get lost in the screen. Yeah, well, you know, the, the word TV set, the word set is an Egyptian word, which means manipulator. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So set, you know, TV set, being in the screen, all of that, is there, there's a, manip- a manipulative quality to it. And I always say that, you know, you can play in that field, but play in that field where you use the giant to do things like, you know, build something Correct. instead of like, can, you know, keep you captivated and, 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 and you know, pulled away mm-hmm. from all of the things that really matter. Exactly. Like, and you can, you can use all things unconscious or subconscious or conscious to manifest. Like I can be around someone who's completely sedated spiritually, but then I'll ask my spirits to send me information through them. And they'll still send me the information. I'm just getting it a different way as opposed to communicating with them telepathically. We can do that with materializing things as well. We can work with the unconscious things to bring, we can program energy fields. That's how powerful we are. We can program vicinities. We can program people who are sleeping. We can program anything to usher in higher information. Yes, we believe that. We are so powerful. We are so powerful beyond belief. It's just a matter of getting in tune with that energy. That's a part of shamanic training for five years. Yeah. Learning how to take energy frequencies and different subtle energy fields and changing the frequency codes, changing the color dynamics, Mm -hmm. and then resetting it into something and then seeing um, and then watching it operate in a different program. It's like that example with the pit bull, like not even having a physical pit bull, but imagining that you're walking with one, you're programming your entire atmosphere to bring to you new information. It's incredible. What do you what do you see? Because you you do a lot of readings and that stuff. I'm yeah. just like I always like to do this with my sure. tribe. What do you see and what do you get from me? You can be completely open and transparent if you like. I get that you're definitely a way shower. For sure. You're here to imprint this planet in a in a major way. And you're you've already done it. You're here, you're doing it. And I think that you may have had times in your life where you were because of the abuse, you might have taken on the opposite. The, the opposite polarity where you, you might have been a little too hard with people at times or too rigid in your ways. And now you're, I'm seeing that you're learning how to soften again because <laughs> <laughs> you're learning how to soften again because I think that 
all those old Atlantean energies, just reading your records for a second, your mm-hmm. Atlantean energies came online when you had your awakening. And you're like, I'm never going to give my power away again. And you almost tipped over into the rigidity, into uh, more of that, like in Atlantis, they had a lot of the, you know, I know this, I'm superior to yeah, you. Yeah, I you remember. Will, right? So even when you say things like, I don't want to be people's guru, you've been that superior to people before. Yes. So you wouldn't say that unless you had been that. And now I'm seeing that there's like everything in your heart is softening and you're coming back into your spirit, trusting that you are safe this time around. No one's going to hurt you. You're safe. And people love you. And by opening up your heart and just being Shaman Jurek that everyone loves, you are going to send an electrical current throughout this entire cosmos. But I I do see that there's a shift. There was a shift probably around like, I would say around eight, nine months ago. I I, just like going in with my third eye and looking into your records. That's right. About eight, nine months ago, you had a shift where you said, I don't want to fight anymore. That's right. I just want to be what I've been placed here to be. That's exactly right. Good. That's exactly what happened to me. I was in London. Yeah. And I was like, wow, I'm really harsh sometimes. And mm-hmm. I can feel the, the, the cracking of the whip, mm-hmm. you know, like, come on, people, let's pull it together, you know. And I just was like, I just really want to um, just be the child who mm-hmm. just loves incessantly. I mean, which, I was loving look, people which, then. Look, there's validity to what you were doing. I mean, I've done it too where I I have to speak like almost like a sergeant, you know? I've done it too because if if someone's not choosing which box of cookies they want, you're going to choose for them. So that didn't come from nowhere. It had to be done because people couldn't think for themselves. But we don't need that anymore because it's obsolete and people are ready to think for themselves. I want to become the most vulnerable person I could ever become. Mm -hmm. That's my dream. Mm -hmm. When I think about Christ, when I think about... Um, I have my my life, I look at like Lord Siddhartha, how he came from this very wealthy family. I came from a very wealthy family mm-hmm. and they were sheltering me a lot and I was going through all my training, going through all this stuff. And then one, and then I just, you know, decided to go away from that. And my father was like, if you step away from this life and you step away from me, I will cut every penny. I will take everything away from you. And I was like, I'm okay with that. Mm-hmm. Like, okay, you want to do, I remember, I remember being, in New York City, and I didn't have money to get on the on. I was uh, um, on a train in a bus, so I was. I had to grab the cup, and I started asking for money on the streets. Mm. And this part of my brain was like, you could easily just call your dad right now, who's a multimillionaire, who will like set you up and put you in a hotel and like do all these things. I just didn't want to, because mm-hmm. I knew that. If I did, I would have to like confront, conform to him. And his mm-hmm. whole thing was like, he wanted to end, he wanted to stop the shamanism in our family, like at my generation. He was like, I, I've had enough, you mm-hmm. know? I want my kids to not be exposed to it. Even though he said those things, we come home and he'd be checking our pockets to make sure no spells were put on us. He would, you know, he, he still kept to the traditions, mm-hmm. but then he also had the religious side as well because my grandfather and him were trying to pull it out of our family. Mm-hmm. So anyone who exuded powers or gifts or whatever, They were trying to like take them and exude and get it out of them as quick as they could. Mm -hmm. And with me, I was the one who was like, no, no, no. And so I was holding the cup and I was like, no, what? I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to be humble. I'm going to accept humility right now. And I'm not going to call my dad and I'm going to do this on my own. I can do this, you know? And that clears the bloodline. It really does because so many old ancestral beliefs are held in place that are limiting. They're, they're antiquated now. And, and so I want people to understand how perfect they are, how divine they are. And if anything in your life is happening right now that is not in harmonic resonance with who you know yourself to be deep down, that's just a program that you're still holding within your body that's externalized. It's externalized. It's in your immediate reality so that you can look at it and once and for all say, I'm done. I don't, I don't need this anymore. We can all have our own unique signatures, you know, and, and be a different breed. I can be an alien from Sirius. You can be an alien from Andromeda. We can hold our own and be different, but respect each other. Absolutely. So it doesn't mean that my way, like I personally can't really hang out with people who are, 
too passive, I'm not able to because their signature isn't very what do you mean passive. Passive where they won't speak their truth <laughs> no, or I can't. where like right I can't I can't do that because that doesn't match my frequency. Yeah. But um I can also appreciate the fact that if that's truly who they are, they're more of the crystal children, they don't want conflict, they don't want that. If they have more of that Pleiadian energy, angelic energy, I can appreciate them for that if that's who they really are, but they might match up with other people who are like them. And then I'll be over here and you'll be over there and we can all respect each other and together build new earth without having to uh, necessarily enmesh with each other. So there's great power in holding your own, great power. And, and holding your own means embracing both the light and the dark and just embodying that, that power. Mm-hmm. Get out of the people pleasing. Get out of the wanting everyone to be happy. If you're afraid to leave a relationship, get out of there. If you're not happy, get out. But make sure that you've taken the lesson though. Because if you don't pull that positive lesson, there's no need to leave. Yeah, what do you think about that hostage relationships, I call them? Holding each other hostage for the sake of safety and the fear of the unknown. It's energetic hoarding is what it is. It's, it's the, the need to hang on to something that you're actually supposed to let go of because you're afraid of the unknown. And we need to get really comfortable with these unfamiliar energies because it's going to happen at an increasingly rapid speed. There's no hiding anymore. You can't hide behind a bush. These energies have been in pouring into the planet and people can't hide. They can't outrun this stuff anymore. All of those shadows, all the, the inauthenticity, all of the, um, the lies, that just won't fly anymore. And people who want to hang on to that, they will be left behind metaphoric, mer- metaphorically because they have their free will. And if they don't want to be a part of the new earth, then they don't have to. But um, a lot of, I have hope for a lot of people right now to come out of these lower layers of reality. I can have we, a lot can of, we change the word hope? Because hope in shamanism means uh, it's the crossroads. Sure. Yeah. Um, I foresee a lot of people coming out, coming out of this. I like that one. I do. And then the people who are overly entrenched in the illusion, who are hanging on to everything that they can because they're too afraid, they will choose a different reality and will still live amongst each other. But Think of like a cop. If you're driving be- beside a cop, even though they're on the same planet as you, they're in a different dimension as you. Mm, good analogy. Planet Earth is multidimensional. So they're seeing life through a completely different lens than you. They're seeing LA as like, oh my God, it's dangerous and we need to go get rid of this guy or arrest this guy. And then you're like, oh, I'm going to the gym. I'm ha- having a fantastic day. And then I have a dinner. And then I have this and I have that. They're on a different dimension as you. Yes. Even though they appear to be on the same street. Yes. That's what I say about people. That's why I tell people you can't take other people's opinions. Mm -hmm. You should only ask yourself or go to spirit because you don't know what dimension that person's in. Right. You put yourself into a very a heap of danger. Exactly. And that's why I encourage people to be the dot. Because unless you know how to timeline jump and how to observe all these energies that are part of a different version of the now. So I'll explain that. Say that someone is making a plan with someone in two weeks. And then that starts to open up a portal of nervousness and they don't know how to handle that nervousness. And leading up to their meeting, they're freaking out. That's not being self-loving. So don't, don't organize that plan. Be a dot. Be in the moment. Get in tune with yourself. If you're able to plan something and then observe the energies coming in from this other person through this portal, because they are portals. When you make a plan with someone, if I say, shaman, let's go out for coffee in a week from now, the next week, I'm probably going to pick up on your frequencies, even though we're not in the same room. Can I observe them? Can I untether myself? If you don't have those tools yet, don't, don't make plans. Learn how to be in the now. Learn how to be present with your journey. Get in tune with all the energies that are around you without attachment to other people because there are already a lot of energies around you. The karmic ones, the karmic issues, the etheric imprints, there's so much to work with, right? Yeah. So without having to tether yourself to a future plan, 
or what might happen in a year from now. In my sessions, I hear a lot of people asking me, Phil, when is this going to happen? That's such a linear question. <laughs> That's a linear question. Yeah, I hear it too. So when, how, where is he, where is she? Linear. It's linear, yeah. which is fine. It's fine. But the gold is under your feet. It's right under your feet. Learn how to extend appreciation for what's here right now. Embrace the moment right now. Get in tune with what's irking you, with what's aggravating you. Get in tune with that. Mine your soul. Be a miner of your soul. Be a miner of your Akashic records. We read Akashic records all the time unconsciously. We don't even know it. But we're so psychic. We're so psychic. Except that the mind or the, the ego is so reinforced, it's so strong that it records this information as anxiety or worry. No, uh, it's not anxiety, worry. It's you picking up on future events. And all you need to do is recognize that there's an activation going on within your body so that you can adapt to that frequency of the future event. So Akashic Records, I just want to go into that because these words are not, they, we don't use these words in shamanism. So yeah. I want to understand. So Akashic Records, because I hear people say it to me and they sometimes think I know what they're talking about. Okay, so, so the Akashic Records would be a living library of Everything that's ever happened is happening and will happen, including everything that might have happened or might happen. Okay, I get it. So okay. it's like a tree. Imagine a tree with infinite branches. So if I look at someone's energy and they're in a relationship where they're at the mercy of this guy, they're hoping that this guy is going to propose, I can look at the record at all of the potentialities and be like, mm, because your 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 power is still in this guy's hands, the chances are you're not going to get the proposal. And then there's another branch or two other branches from there. How are you going to handle it? Oh, I see that the potential is that this is going to happen after that. So it's the records of everything that might happen. And it's called Akashic Records? Yeah, it's called Akashic Records. Okay, that makes sense. So in shamanism, we have these spirits. They're called Obarian spirits. They're kind mm -hmm. of an ET council. Mm-hmm. And what they do is they, they're called watchers. They record every possibility of possibility of possibility of possibility of possibility. And their, their mind is like, a, uh, they're a species that their mind is like a, like a huge um, a stream of energy and light. And they hold every possibility in every dimension at any part of the galaxy. They see everything and they and people can tap into their energy and they download their all of their consciousness into that person. Same thing. Same so it's concept. the same same concept. Same concept. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. And um we have to be mindful of where we open up these possibilities. Because I was talking to someone yesterday and I was saying that if you run a red light, you've just opened up another field of possibility where in two weeks from now or in a year from now, you're going to get pulled over or you might get in an accident and you may think that it has nothing to do with that moment where you run, ran the red light, but it does. Everything is connected. So you're opening up a dimensional portal and you're inviting these possibilities that are not for you. They're actually detrimental. Mm -hmm. And so be mindful of where you open your portals. That's why I tell people don't mess around with magic if they don't have knowledge. Don't, if they, if exactly. they have no knowledge in magic. Yeah. They're just like dabblers. Yeah. Don't be a dabbler. Uh, so uh, going back to something that, was, that you were saying that I wanted to expound upon. Oh, yes. Where we're talking about relationships. So I have this belief of no compromise relationship mm -hmm. because I've been through relationships. Mm -hmm. And what I've learned about my relationships is that every time I give in to wanting to compromise some aspect of myself to make the other person happy or feel good or feel safe or whatever it may be, mm -hmm is the moment when I start hating myself. It's the moment that I start creating distortion within myself. It's like an infestation, right? Yeah, I feel like I've, I've taken myself down in my mm -hmm. own evolution, and then my little boy, which is the creator, says to me, you're not honoring me. Mm -hmm. And so I got now I'm in this whole thing where I don't compromise anything. Mm -hmm. And I want to know your thoughts about that. I think that's a great approach because you're honoring and hearing what your soul is needing, what your inner child, that little boy is needing, sometimes we compromise too much. And I've even had this thought where when we're on dating apps 
they're great. I mean, don't get me wrong. I think you can meet your soulmate on a dating app. But you do? I think it's possible. Yeah. I do. <laughs> I love you. I think it's possible. But I also think that we need to <laughs> we should get a sponsor for yeah. a dating app. <laughs> I think I think mastery is about being okay with not being on one and still trusting that the universe will bring that to you. And so if you can be on a dating app without the attachment to the outcome of being on one, then you're handling it the right way. And same goes with relationships. Like I see so many people sacrificing themselves to in in hopes that this person is going to propose or whatever. And it's like, why are you why are you doing that? You look depleted. I call it desperados. Yeah, and and, and the the problem with that is they don't understand that they're creating their own des- demise. They're destroying the reality, and something will eventually happen to wake them up. But time doesn't exist, and it does exist. In that, if let's say you're a woman and you have a biological clock that's ticking and you're not hearing call from spirit, spirit is saying you need to leave this relationship. We have something else in store for you. And if you're stubborn and stubborn and stubborn and stubborn, well, guess what? You may not have children. The potentiality increases of you not having children. Or children of your own. Uh, children of your own. Right. So, so we really need to be diligent with listening and tuning into our guides or to our inner voice. It's all the same thing. I mean, your guides are you. They're just higher aspects of you, but they're, they're different. It's, it's, but it's all the same, really. So being more diligent about listening and tuning in. And if you decide to remain in that relationship where the guy isn't proposing, when you're not able to have children, then be okay with it. Right. Be okay with it. Choose to be there. But when the cop arrests you after you burn that red light, be okay with it. <laughs> you opened up that portal. That's good medicine. Man. <laughs> that's good medicine. Because not that. Yeah, that's good medicine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because I think I think that a lot of times um, people don't step into that space. You know, and we call responsibility the ability to respond. Yeah. And they don't step into that space of recognizing the patterns that they have created by certain choices. Mm-hmm. You know, like I'll say to my niece, don't eat French fries because they cause inflammation in your body for 24 hours. And then she'll eat them Nothing happens to her right away. Nothing happens to her the next day. A week later, she has stomach pains Mm -hmm. or she's having these things. And I said, she goes, what do you think it is? I said, it's those French fries from a couple weeks ago. It could be a multiple, it could have been something you did two months ago, a year ago, something you put in your body, you ate, and now your body has registered it and the toxins are built built up. So just embrace your stomach ache and like, and work and then do what you need to do to alleviate that or clean that out and get your microbiome back into a, a better state. But a lot of times what happens is people go into these places where they're not consciously looking at themselves as creators. Mm-hmm. It's almost like and they're the looking universe, outside somewhere. And the universe will always take it away if you're not in your, your state of empowerment. Always. If people understood that. But the thing is, most people have made too many agreements with the dark side. So they've given limbs away to those forces to those entities. They're like, here, here's my arm and I'm going to stay in this relationship. <laughs> and they don't realize like physically they look fine. You're killing me. Over I love There's it. So killing you with love but and hum- wisdom. And I wish people, humans are so strong. Yeah. They go to work with 15 demons attached to them. Yeah, <laughs> I know. <laughs> They, they can have 15 demons attached to them and they're like, let's go to Tim Hortons or Dunkin' Donuts. Get that coffee. <laughs> and they're so strong. Yes. That's why I don't think we're uh, uh, an unevolved species. If anything, I think we are the evolved ones because we knew that we could see this planet would change. We're so strong. But going back to what I was sharing with the, uh, with the, the demonic attachment, people sell their soul all the time. And they're like, oh, and, and and you know what? Those forces will give you a lot. Oh, they'll, yeah, they, they'll, they'll, they'll cut they'll you paychecks, they'll pay, paychecks, paychecks, gifts, Louis Vuitton, Rolexes, right? A nice roof <laughs> with this guy that's not going to marry you. Mm-hmm. Comfort that looks like comfort, <laughs> but you're actually sitting in a bed of nails. <laughs> <laughs> you are, it looks it looks like it's paradise, but you're actually sitting in shit. It looks like paradise, but your 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 spiritual self looks like it has it's missing two arms <laughs> and it's missing a butt cheek. I know I call it. I just, <laughs> it's missing one butt cheek and 
You don't have hair. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I told people, I go, you look like a golem. They're like, what are you talking about? They go, I look gorgeous. What are you talking about? I just got these boobs done. I did this. I did that. I said, no, honey. I go, you don't know what you look like. <laughs> you just don't know. <laughs> because of the way our eyes see, we see into that dimension of what it really looks like. Exactly. Not the, I call it the, I called it being glam. I call it be glamoured. Yeah. Right. So be glamour to me. Like when I look at those films, like, um, you know, the vampire films where they glamour someone and then they can tell them what they want to do, that vampire can tell yeah. them and so forth. That's what I, I say that the Matrix is doing. It glamours people mm-hmm. with the mm-hmm. be glamoured and then they get all glamoured and they actually think that their life is this amazing thing. <laughs> They're just like, you know, sitting in this house. Oh, look at my house, Tom and Dirk, and all these things, and da 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 da. And I'm looking at it, and I see like when I look at their home, they're thinking that it's this, you know, beautiful palace with like swimming pool and all this. And I see black walls, yeah. and I see like screaming sounds and weird. They're, yeah, they're living in their wound. Yeah, that's where they're living. Ooh, in the wound. ouch, ouch. And what's even crazier is that wound isn't even real. It's a program. Yeah, isn't that crazy? It's crazy. <laughs> it's so crazy. It's so crazy. I must people at, right now who are listening to this share must be, their minds are blown. They're <laughs> lit, lit and like crazy. Because exactly. And I, I love that you said that because I tell people, I'm like, do you realize right now that uh, that computer chip that you've, that you've set up to have this whole like matrix, con, mm-hmm. you know, consortium that you are living in right now isn't real? It's not real. And what you're experiencing right now, like that's not really doing anything. Like mm-hmm. that's, you're, you're glamored. You're in a glam. I caught, you know, in one of my favorite shows as a kid was Star Trek. Mm-hmm. And I love Star Trek because I love um, when they would go into these holodecks mm-hmm. and they would say country Western at level seven. You know, and they would be in this whole country western thing and have to shoot out and do all these things. And they would work through their fears because yeah. they would create these holographic planes that were real. You touch it, you get hurt, you'd experience all these things. And then the computer would synthesize all of your information of what you learned and then set up another level for you when you go back the next day mm-hmm. to help you overcome those things. What well, people are doing it all the time, but right. they're using matrix trips. Yeah. These matrix chips are set up to keep you in that construct. Yes. And, and they're always, in a way, you could say they're always going to be programs because if this is simulation, it'll always be a program, but it'll hold a higher resonance, a higher vibration. So you could say that me and you are sitting here right now and it's just an illusion. And then tomorrow we won't, we're going to move forward, right? But there are a lot of people, if people understood that their current situation is what they need to keep growing. Like, we're both growing through this podcast. We're both enjoying this oh, yeah. conversation. I love being with you. So when people, are, <laughs> when people are in a really dysfunctional relationship, that situation is just trying to show you something about yourself, whether it be positive or negative. And you need to take inventory and know that every situation is impermanent. Me and you are not going to be here tomorrow. It's an impermanent situation. It's what you do with it and what comes after it. What are you going to do with that? Yes. But some people, it's funny because we can go on a first date with someone and our inner voice, our inkling is like, nope, they're not the one. And then we feel bad because we're programmed. So then we go into guilt. I'll give them another chance. And then you end up in an eight-year relationship with them only to come back to the initial point of they weren't the one. That's right. People do that to themselves all the time. But because they're programmed with guilt or fear or shame, they then retract and they go, no, I'll give them another chance. Boom. They just hit you. They just got your energy for the next eight years. Yeah. People have a lot of, um, have difficulties with me at times because I get a lot of, um, Flat. Yeah, because I go and people will invite me to their homes or have asked me to come stay a night or, you know, whatever. And when there's distortion in their relationship or distortion in the way they treat their kids or distortion in the way they run their business, because of my energy and my light, it, sh- it brings, it, it like takes the illusion mm-hmm. and opens it up for them. Mm-hmm. And then they start getting upset with me being around because they're like... All the stuff that they've been masking in that distortion starts showing up and coming out. Like just recently, I was with a friend of mine. We were in Mallorca. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, her, hus- her not even her husband, her boyfriend was so abusive to her. 
But she what didn't see the abuse. She was just living in this beautiful, he's like, you know, he's this millionaire and they're living in this fabulous house. And she had me and my niece come into her home. And, you know, and we were there together. And just my being there made everything unravel mm. in front of her. You know, she saw everything. Just by me being there, she, every piece started coming. And he was like, he kicked me out of his out of the house. Sure. He was, you know, he's like, you need to leave now. You need to get out of here. And it was, um, and I said, well, obviously he's kicking me out because I'm shining the light. You're exposing it all. I'm exposing it. You unzip the garment bag. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you, unzip, <laughs> you unzip the garment bag and you expose it all. Yeah. And, yeah. The, and the same thing happened when I was just recently in uh, Florida staying with another uh, friend who was a student who's trained with me in shamanism, who her and her husband invited me in the house. And the first night I got into the house, these two spirits were in front of my bed and I was like laying down and I went into my astral body and then took one spirit and grabbed it and gave it all this love and then sent it to the light. But the other one was running through the wall. So I was chasing after it. And after a while I lost, I just, I lost it. It was hiding really well. And then the next day, my friend is looking at me strange. And I said, well, what's, what's your problem? What's going on, honey? And she's like, I, you know, I, I just, I, I, you know, you are not what you say you are. I, I think, I think you need to leave. You need to mm. leave. And I was like, hmm, okay. I was like, well, if you want me to leave, that's fine. You know, I can have me and uh, my niece, Alex, we can go get a place. And then she's like, no, I want you to stay. I want you to stay. Mm. And it was like this back and forth. Long story made short. She asked me to do this spell for her to help her with some problems in her life. And as I went to do the spell, I couldn't pull the spell and I kept feeling like there was a cloak on the house. So I was like, wait a second, I need to do something. And so I was like, there's a cloak on this house. There's something hiding here that I have to uncover before I can't do this spell. My ancestors told me to uncloak the house. So I uncloaked the house and this spirit was standing there mm. and it jumped in my body took me to a car. I was in a car. It was him and his wife. And then I saw her and she was at a party and she was doing stuff and she was getting in her car. She was drunk. And then all of a sudden, like she, you know, we were in the car and then she smashed into the car. I saw the woman uh, fly into the, the window. Mm -hmm. She died. And then I felt my neck turn all the way around and it cracked my spine. And mm -hmm. then I died and he made, I, li I relived that spirit's thing. And then I looked at her and then the spirit jumped in my body and started screaming at her. And I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. You're not going to use my body like that. I'm not mm -hmm. going to have it. Yeah. And I found out that she had, she was, um, she had, you know, had a situation where she was driving drunk and killed this, this couple and the spirit uh, the woman went into the light, but the husband became uh, a wraith. He decided not to go in the light and he wanted to make her life a living hell. And so all of this thing came unraveled. When my niece was next to me. She was like, oh my God, what are you doing, uncle? And... So I was, I was, inter I was, you know, mediating between him and her and, you know, working through the situation. And it's just like, I'm like, oh God, I just came here to relax. <laughs> yeah, that's why I stay in hotels now. <laughs> it's too distorting. But I think with you and I, you know, because yeah. we have such a high vibration light, yeah. anything that's distorted oh, yeah. just comes out. Well, if you think about it, if, if you're completely aligned, there's nothing for me to read, Right. I can, but if I meet you, I'd probably be like, you're great because there's nothing to, you're aligned. Right. We can feel, we can pick up, intuitively pick up on all those misalignments. And that's what we're here to do is to try to help people clear those, help people yeah. get back, come back to their power. And personal power is everything because personal power is what allows you to be magnetic. Mm -hmm. It is. And when you give the power away, you demagnetize yourself. And then you're having to chase people, be at the mercy of people, depend on other people to provide for you, and so on and so on. When you have your personal power, things come and get you. You don't go get anything. They come get you. Can we get a, <laughs> can we get, let's do an amen, an a, a man, a woman, hallelujah. Yeah. Ow! And it really just takes a second to take your power back. But most people still want to live in that melodrama. Of like, oh, you know, I'll keep, I'll stay in this and gradually take it back. You can look in the mirror and say, I'm done with every agreement I've ever made that's kept me anchored into a lower timeline. You can say, it, it takes one second for you not to belong to anything anymore. Yes, I call it victim empowerment. I feel like people use the victim energy mm -hmm. to get empowered, to get love that they feel they never got before. Yeah, and I think one good place to start would be to stop saying that you're broken and you need to heal. Stop saying you're broken 
that you need to heal. You've been programmed, people. Your perception has been tampered with. Your manipulation has been hijacked. Sorry, your perception's been hijacked. Stop saying you're broken. Own it. And if someone says something to you that doesn't sit well with you, say, hey, I don't agree with that. That's it. But you don't let these things in anymore because yep. they, will, they will truly pirate your energy. They will snack on you. They will make a buffet of you. But start claiming that you are whole again. And that, I think, is truly going to be the recipe to fast-tracking us into the DNA, DNA acceleration, truly. Yes. It's, a, it's a matter of claiming it. Stop with the whole I'm breathing light into this trauma. You don't have a trauma. You were programmed. <laughs> Delete that shit. Exactly. Erase and replace. Exactly. Erase, replace. That's yeah. it. I'm erasing this lack of self-worth with I'm going to go out and treat myself like a queen today. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's that. That right there is the truth. We, you know, it... it they, see that what you just said. I love the whole idea you use the pirate because it's it really true. They are they, someone is pirating their vessel, mm -hmm. and people don't really see that. But I love that you use the word pirate, and I think that's brilliant. Mm -hmm. But I think that is the key to staying on the lit train. I tell my tribe all the time: it's about staying lit, staying on the lit train, drinking the lit juice, and being the litty committee. And the litty committee, <laughs> we don't we don't play in the ro the, ro the game of lack and limitation. We don't go, oh, there's this pain deep down inside. I tell people, really, where? And if it is, did you, you say it's deep. Do we need a submarine? Are we, are we going on some kind of like, you know, spelunking? What do we have to do to get into this, this program that you've created that there's a, some ch cavern that we have to go through mm -hmm. to get to this pain? H how about it's not even down in some kind of cavern that it's actually left you like mm -hmm. right now? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, I want people to go out for a walk. And imagine that you're this fierce goddess that has three giant snakes around you. And you're going to raise one eyebrow like you're giving attitude. <laughs> <laughs> and you're going to walk straight forward and look at everything in the face. Everything. You're untouchable. You're impervious. You're indestructible. Start working with that energy. And for, God, and for men too. Gods. Everyone. Gods and goddesses. Exactly. Everyone. Everyone. Ugh. We could, you know, I. We can I, go on for like six. We can hours. go on for six hours. We can go on for. Two I feel days. like I'm just warming up. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> oh my love, yeah. we've been going now. We literally have now hit the two hour mark. Oh wow! Yeah. Well, good for us. Yes. So I, I you know, I know I have to go because I have to teach this um yeah. this uh workshop tonight. Uh, but I just want to say, it's been an honor. Same here. It was such a pleasure, and I'm so glad we finally got to meet in person. Yeah. Well, actually, we bumped into each other about a few months ago, but yes. to actually connect with you intimately is such a, an honor for me as well. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and I am so grateful. How can people find you? How can they get involved in you? You know, I'm, and everyone, I'm just, I'm, 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 I'm telling Phil that he needs to have his own podcast. So <laughs> if you get this message, send him a message saying, Phil, what about that podcast? <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. So you can find me at Feel Good Life on Instagram. So at Feel Good Life. Also my YouTube channel. I've been putting out a lot of messages. YouTube.com slash Feel Good Life. And my website is feelgoodlife.com. And you can book a reading there. I open up slots um, at 7 p.m. Pacific time nightly. I don't open up anything in advance just because my spirits, my guides have told me to to just be a dot. <laughs> I love <laughs> and it. And keep going with it. And so that's where they can find me. Fantastic. And tribe go find him uh thank you so much for being on this share You're today welcome. thank you as well for having me i appreciate you i appreciate you <laughs> <laughs> okay tribe how how lit are you right now do you feel that fire do you feel that inferno? Do you feel that blaze? You remember I talk about blaze when you're so lit and you're in that blaze and you're unstoppable and you can do anything and that everything you touch turns to gold because that's how powerful you are. Do you see how that blaze has hit you right now? Are you on blaze right now, tribe? Because I know you are because you're so powerful and Phil is so powerful and we're all so powerful in this share, the energy that has just been moving through the words, the energy is transmuting all of that darkness, all of that separation, all of that limitation and just bringing it into just pure light. And that love energy has lifted and shifted you and taken you on a journey 
of complete surrender. And I love that. I love you. And I am so happy that you got to be on today's Ancient Wisdom Today Share. And for those of you who aren't following me, you can go to Shaman Dirk on Instagram. Sign up on my newsletter if you want to get involved in shamanism and you want to learn and you want to access technique and you want to understand knowledge of shamanism and the roots and all of these different things. Please check that out by signing up on my newsletter. Check out Phil. He gave you the information. Utilize it because it's about keeping us with gems and rubies and diamonds in our lives. And Phil is one of those. And so when you have a gem, when you have a ruby, when you have a diamond, when I bring people onto the share of the tribe... It is not just for your listening ears. It's about you getting engaged with them so that you're able to take yourself higher. When we build that energy, right? When you build a fire, you have to put different woods down. Each wood is a part of a tribal energy, um, effort and energy that we're bringing forth. So I love you all so much. And remember, there's only one of you and there's only one moment. And that moment is now. So seize the moment, live your life, live it to the fullest, no excuses, and I'll see you on the next share. Bye, tribe.